Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our OPSERT, excuse me, our OPSERT uh, water chemistry for treatment. Um, today we'll be in session from 8 a.m. to noon. We've got quite a few presentations for you today for your learning. Um, please feel free to ask questions at the end of each presentation. Um, all the presenters today will also have their information posted on the agenda in the handout section and at the end of the PowerPoint in case you have follow-up questions. Uh, let's go ahead and jump right in. As most of you um, are already assessed, we're going to be covering uh, chlorination, DBPs, um, and a bit of the DBP rule. Um, specifically, it looks like stage two. Um, first, a little bit of housekeeping rules. Uh, the PDHs are located in the handout section. Uh, so if you need that agenda, that's where you want to go to get it. Uh, the webcams are disabled and all attendees are muted um, for the entire webinar. If you have questions, go ahead and uh, type them out in the question box underneath handouts. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and we will be posting this to our OPSERT website um, under the presentation library. Uh, they usually post within the next two weeks and they are usable uh, or they can be viewed in a, after recording for PDHs. And if you have any questions <clears throat> on OPSERT or the event itself, um, go ahead and email us at this azopsert, azdq.gov email, or you can give us a call. All right, just a bit of order of events today. We're going to be covering a few OPSERT updates and including our new fee, newest fee waiver, HB 2741. Uh, we'll be going into chlorination and chemical dosing math from 810 to about 11. Um, so that'll be just a two hour event straight through. Uh, so please be attentive. We'll be taking a break out of 1050 to 11 and then we'll move on to DBPs in Arizona and the disinfectant byproduct rule. Bit of an update on a OPSERT Cup Dev event coming up in March. We will be hosting a one and a half day in-person training with three tracks, operator management and role. Uh, these, uh, are already in development, they're set to go. We just need to send out the registration. Just for your information today, just save the date. We'll be hosting this event March 15th and 16th in Camp Verde uh, for the Cliff Castle Casino. And also the following week, we'll be going to Tucson, March 22nd to 23rd. First day will be a full day, 7.30 to 3.30. Second day will be a half day. Uh, just so you know, for the half day for operators, it will be there will be no rule track, but for the operators, it will be a math, uh, a math day, math app day. Excuse me. Cost is always free for um, ADEQ events. Just show up, and we'll be sending out the registration notices within the next few weeks. Okay, now just to give a brief overview of the HB 2741 um, fee waiver. Uh, apologies, I did not introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ebony Rohn. I'm the Operator Certification Program Coordinator for the Drinking Water Value Stream. Um, we do have a new OPSERT Program Coordinator for the wastewater drinking side, and you guys will be meeting her soon, or if you haven't already talked to her, her name is Tina Pico. All right, let's get into this fee waiver. Uh, just a little bit of overview. Uh, this will be a very short presentation. Um, Go over the uh, bill, how to qualify, the application process, our review process, and if there are any questions. Okay, so the House bill was actually introduced by, uh, excuse me, by, was approved by Governor Ducey last year in July, but became live for the OPSERT program October 1st of last year as well. <clears throat> uh, it was created to provide some financial assistance to military personnel, their spouses, and people. Um, making low income. Uh, the fee waiver only applies to people who are uh, registering with ADQ for the first time. So this is your first time getting an OPSERT number and a certification. So this will help bring in uh, new operators into the workforce um, if anyone meets the qualifications. 
The fee waiver uh, covers the new certification fee, the reciprocity application fee, and the early exam application fee if you qualify. You do have to apply and be approved before you complete either three of those processes. <clears throat> and like I said, you do need to be a first time applicant to register with ADQ. To qualify for the waiver, uh, for the income part, you, your income cannot exceed 200% of the federal poverty guidelines. We do have a chart and there's the, the numbers have changed for 2023. It's a very easy, uh, excuse me, search to make sure you're not going over the income if you are going to use the income option. Um, the second option is to be honorably discharged within the last two years of your application and you will need to provide discharge forms. I'll go over that in a second. A uh, second, a third qualification is to be a spouse of an active member um, in this military. Uh, the fee waiver um, site, uh, the link to the fee waiver site is on the officer page within the fees themselves. And it does go over everything I just talked to you about. Um, you will have uh, the application through this link here on this website. And then once you're approved, you will be able to register directly onto the OPSERT portal. So the application is as such. Please make sure every information that you're adding onto the application is up to date. We will be using that information to start the process for your portal account. So if you're using your income, as you can see here on the application, You'll want to list your combined family gross in, um, gross income, adjusted gross income, and then how many people are in your, your household, and then choose the certification type that you're going for, new certificate, reciprocity, early exam. And then since this is a legal document under 109 for operators, we do need to make sure you're giving us um, legitimate information. We don't want to have to come back and with an audit and then revoke your certifications that you earned through this waiver. Um, for veterans who are um, who were honorably discharged in the last two years, we do need your D form 214, or I think for the National Guard, it's uh, NGB-22 that will need to be uploaded for spouses. We'll need to see your military orders and your copy of a, a copy of your valid ma marriage license. Okay. And this was just a close-up of the income. Uh, this is uh, just the follow-up email you'll receive after you submit your application. Um, please allow us a week to process, um, excuse me, about one to three days to process. <clears throat> when we first started, it was about a week. Um, this is an example of a discharge, um, discharge form. Uh, you can get these through the VA ordered or sent to you or requested and we just upload a copy. <clears throat> Here's a list right now. This is 2022, 2023 has changed, so I need to update this. And then once you get that approval, um, we'll be sending you the waiver link. And then that's once you, you will still need to go sign up for the exam, pass it. And then you can proceed uh, with the waiver by coming back with your 70% or better mastery report and click on the submit your certificate. And if for any reason you were denied or we need more information, we'll definitely reach out to you as well. All right. Any questions? Any questions right now? All right. All right. We're going to go ahead and move on with our first presentation from Joe Kwana. Oh, Kwaneo, excuse me. All right, Joe, I'm going to go ahead and pass the screen to you. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready, Ebony. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. 
Okay, well, good morning, everyone. <laughs> Hope everybody's awake this morning. Everybody's had their coffee. Want to welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Joe Cornejo, and I am an associate with KUB Consultants and a water treatment operator by all other terms. Just to give you a very small background, I've been in the field for over 30 years, and I just want to let everyone know on this uh, webcast that I'm continuing to learn more and more valuable information as concerns portable water treatment. Um, it's an amazing field. It's always growing. It's always expanding. There's always new technologies being demonstrated, which are beneficial to, to uh, you know, the portable water consumer. And uh, I, I really have a lot of fun, you know, preparing uh, this type of information, in particular for this morning's webinar. And I hope that you will benefit as much from the information as I have. Now, once again, uh, this has to do with potable drinking water and the chlorination practices and how it benefits. And uh, chlorination applies to basically all four of the ways of the water treatment disciplines. And everybody knows that you have drinking water, you have wastewater, you have distribution, and you also have collections. We're gonna be focusing today, particularly on the drinking water side of uh, chlorination. So what are the learning objectives of uh, today's uh, seminar? Well, the learning objectives is that what is chlorine? There's a lot of you that uh, obviously you know this, the answer to this question, but there's also a lot of operators or technicians tied in today that uh, they're new to the field. So this is a, a very beneficial question to pose at this moment. What is chlorine? And what is the history of chlorine use, particularly in this country, the United States? We're also going to go briefly over the different types of chlorine because uh, in drinking water, there are different types of, of chlorine that are used to disinfect the water. Now, disinfect is going to be one of the terms that we're going to be covering today. And then third, we're hoping to explain how chlorine is used specifically in treating drinking water, making it portable for use. So uh, let's go ahead and get into our explanation. Now, what is chlorine? That's a very important question. You know, chlorine is not new to the scene. As a matter of fact, chlorine was discovered in 1774, and it was discovered by a chemist by the name of Carl Scheel. And it was identified as an element by another chemist named Humphrey Davy in 1810. So if you can do the math, it's almost been 250 years ago that chlorine was discovered. So it's not a new chemical, it's not a new element that uh, that uh, is basically known to us. But the interesting thing is, when was, when was chlorine used in water treatment? Well, I'm gonna jump to my next screen here. And you're, you're gonna see that chlorine is a chemical element. And it, uh, it's the second lightest member of the halogens. Now note that is an, it is an oxidizer. And what that basically means uh, is it pulls electrons out of other compounds. Now, if I was to put it in the simplest terms possible, what an oxidizer does is that it burns up things, it ashes things. And then uh, later on in this uh, presentation, we're going to see specifically why that oxidizing ability of chlorine is very be beneficial when it comes to drinking water. So now let's go over some brief facts about chlorine. Okay, chlorine. Well, first of all, is a very toxic. It's a corrosive. It's a greenish, yellowish gas. Uh, those who have, have been exposed to it know that it has a harsh and pleasant odor. It's very irritating to the eyes, very irritating to the lungs. And one interesting thing about chlorine, it's got a density of approximately 2.5 times that of air. What that means is that it's heavier than air. It's denser than air. And so if chlorine escapes into the environment, what's going to, what is it going to do? It's going to sink to the bottom of, it, of, of any surface, uh, which is immediately in contact with. That is why some of these uh, chlorine storage buildings, when they have ventilation systems, those ventilation systems basically evacuate air from the bottom of that building or that storage uh, containment, because that's what chlorine does. It's heavier than air and it will sink to the bottom. Now you can see this, uh, this picture, this image that I have here on the screen, and that's a controlled release of chlorine gas that was done in the Mojave Desert. And as you can see, once again, it is denser than air because it's not floating up, up into the atmosphere, it's actually sticking straight to the ground. 
And the interesting thing is that, yes, it is uh, greenish yellow in color, it is toxic, but it also expands 460 times in air. So you can imagine that if you haven't released a chlorine to the environment, uh, you better be pretty far away. Uh, you better evacuate because it's gonna expand quite a bit and affect uh, whatever is in its near vicinity. Um, now let's get specifically into the use of chlorine. Okay, we're gonna enter now into the, the, basically the term that we use to title this presentation, which is chlorination. So what is chlorination? Well, we already know more or less what chlorine is. Now, chlorination, according to the definition, is the application of chlorine to water for the purpose of disinfection. Now, that term disinfection, we're going to come to understand it uh, very clearly. Disinfection is very different from sterilization, okay, because disinfection basically disables microorganisms. Sterilization destroys microorganisms. Now we'll give a more detailed explanation of what this actually means and, and why it's important to the water field. But chlorine is, in simple terms, a disinfectant. It disinfects drinking water. Okay, very important question. When was it used for portable water? Well, we already, uh, we already know that chlorine has been around for quite a bit of time. It was discovered about 250 years ago. But uh, it's only been a little over 100 years that chlorine has been used in the United States for disinfection purposes. As a matter of fact, uh, public drinking water supplies in the United States have been chlorinated since 1908. So it hasn't been uh, uh, very long, but uh, it's been longer than most of it, when pretty much I like to say all of our lifetimes. So it's been around as a beneficial chemical for a long time. And I just want to state this that it is the standard method, I'll repeat, the standard method of drinking water disinfection in the United States, and, and, and for that matter, in many other countries. So how is it used in drinking water? Well, chlorine, as, as I repeat, is an oxidizer. So being that it oxidizes and helps precipitate minerals out of water, what it does is that it will remove tastes, it removes odors, and it removes color from the water. But it also does, it also controls algae, bacteria, and slime growth in potable water storage tanks and distribution uh, system lines. So it is far, it is by far the most commonly used chemical. And what it does is it actually, it, it makes water potable and palatable. And what we mean by palatable is it also makes it look nice. And, and if you dose chlorine in water correctly, it also doesn't have an undesirable taste. It actually has a decent taste. So it makes water potable and palatable. So now let's get into a slide that talks about uh, the different types of chlorine. Okay, so you can see that I have four images on the screen here. The top five, the, the first image of a working in a clockwise motion that's a picture of chlorine gas tanks. Now those are 150 pound chlorine gas tanks, or we, we use a term in the, in the industry, cylinders. Now these cylinders hold chlorine gas. Now we, we call them 150 uh, uh, pound uh, cylinders, not because they weigh 150 pounds. They have 150 pounds of liquid chlorine compressed inside of them. The cylinders themselves weigh over 300 pounds but the gas is compressed so much that you have basically 150 pounds of chlorine gas in there uh, or in liquid form that can be, once it, it enters into uh, atmospheric pressure, it vaporizes into a gas. Now these cylinders hold chlorine at a concentration of 100%. So chlorine gas is the strongest form of chlorine. It is 100% chlorine. And there's many municipalities today that are shying away uh, from the use of chlorine gas due to the safety implications. I've worked with industries uh, that uh, they had uh, gas chlorination sheds very near uh, an elementary school. Now we remember that chlorine gas expands for 160 times. So should there have been a problem or emergency with one of those uh, chlorine cylinders leaking, then you can imagine that we'd have to evacuate the school. So the safety implication sometimes makes it that there's many municipalities today that 
they don't fear that they don't feel that it's worth the risk. And so you won't see nowadays a lot of uh, private industries and municipalities that are using compressed chlorine glass cylinders uh, for, for disinfection. Now, the second form of chlorine is calcium hypochlorite, and that's 60% uh, chlorine. You can see the, uh, the, the, uh, what looks like a white hockey puck, and that's right here. That's moving clockwise. That's the second image on the screen. That is, uh, that is a more common form of chlorine used in the industry nowadays because it is safer than chlorine gas. I'm going to get into more detail in another slide on the properties of, uh, of this calcium hypochlorite. The other form of chlorine that is used in the industry is sodium hypochlorite. Now, we don't want to use, com com confuse sodium hypochlorite with uh, bleach because sodium hypochlorite, a lot of people use the term, oh, it's pool chlorine. Well, yes, uh, it's, it is used to chlorinate pools because it's a stronger percentage than, than just regular household bleach that you find on the, on the aisle in Walmart. Sodium hypochlorite usually averages about 12.5% chlorine strength. It can go up to 15, uh, depending on, on how fresh and the product is. But generally, when you receive a shipment of sodium hypochlorite, it's going to be between 12 to 15, average 12.5% uh, chlorine strength. And then last of all, well, you have bleach. We generally don't use bleach in treating drinking water, but it is, uh, it is a form of chlorine that we're most familiar with. Uh, we use it to... Uh, to do our laundry at home, we use it to disinfect things at home, and then bleach is of a strength of three to five percent. So it is the weakest form of chlorine, and generally not used in water treatment. So let's get into the two forms uh, of uh, chlorine that are most widely used. Now we already made mention that gas. Uh, there's a lot of municipalities that are doing away with this. We're not we're not going to touch due to time limitations. We're not going to touch too much on on chlorine gas, but we're going to get into first of all sodium hypochlorite. And once again, this is a, the image of sodium hypochlorite. It's a uh, clear, yeah, yeah, light yellow green liquid. And then it's 12, once again, to 15% strength. And sodium hypochlorite has decent stability, but this is a very interesting fact. You see where in, in my bullet point it says concentration? It says, uh, now that's a typo right there. The lower the concentration of sodium hypochlorite, the more stable it is. So, in other words, a concentration of 15% hypochlorite is going to be less stable than a concentration of 12%. Now, one of the last places that I worked for, which was a white tanks water treatment plant, which is run by, uh, by uh, EPCOR USA, which is a surprise, Arizona, they get sodium hypochlorite, but they get it at a 5% uh, concentration. So that's very similar to the, the strength of chlorine beach, but why do they get it in a 5%? Because it's more stable. And what do I mean by that? That means that that chlorine is going to degrade at a much slower rate than a 15% chlorine is. 15% chlorine is more unstable. And so a lot of the, uh, especially with heat and with light, a lot of the actual chlorine will dissipate. It will form a gas and will escape into the atmosphere. Or you get precipitation inside of the liquid. A lot of the chlorine salts tend to precipitate to the bottom, but when you get 5% chlorine, that chlorine tends to last a lot longer and maintain its strength a lot longer. And that's why there's some companies, especially during the summer when we get that 110 to 115 degree heat here in the valley, uh, they tend to want to use 5% sodium hypochlorite because it's going to retain its properties a lot longer than 12 to 15% sodium hypochlorite. The storage time uh, generally for this liquid is recommended a 30 day limit. After 30 days, you can expect that it's going to be losing some of its strength. So that's why when you place a, uh, an order of sodium hypochlorite, you're hoping to use that volume that you placed on order within 30 days. And then once again, you don't want to expose it to light. Usually the, the storage tanks are in an in enclosed building where they're protected by sunlight, or they're in tanks that are insulated tanks that are also protected from sunlight to help the sodium hypochlorite to maintain its strength. Okay, <clears throat> let's go ahead and talk about the next type of, uh, of chlorine used in, uh, in the industry. And this is calcium hypochlorite. Now, calcium hypochlorite is dry. It, uh, it's more stable than sodium hypochlorite because within a year's time, it only uses, loses three to 5% of its strength. 
And that one you can keep you know, in stock to about 30 to 60 days. So when you're comparing it to sodium hypochlorite, which is a liquid form, uh, you've got about 30 more days of storage before you can see that your, your tablets are, are going to start losing their strength. It's also affected by heat and it's also affected by organic material. Now, this next bullet point is very important and it says vent because who's at, whoever has worked with, uh, with calcium hypochlorite and it comes in two forms. It comes in powdered form, as you can see where my cursor is pointing, and it also comes in tablet form. The most common type the most common form is the tablet form because there's tablet chlorinators that are used in the industry. And you insert these tablets in those chlorinators and then the, the chlorinator starts basically dissolving those tablets, adding chlorine to your water to treat it. So these tablets, um, when I was mentioning the word vent, in the buckets that they're stored, in, you have to be very careful opening because they sometimes tend to build up gas. And then there's many operators, including your presenter, who have had a, a nasty reminder of how important it is to open the buckets in a well-ventilated area because they tend to off-gas, especially during hot weather, especially during humid weather. Uh, you have to be very careful opening these calcium hypochlorite buckets. But it is a very a more stable, uh, more powerful uh, source of chlorine or type of chlorine than sodium hypochlorite. And that's why there's a lot of municipalities and a lot of fiber industries that will use calcium hypochlorite in treating their water. So we already, so we've gone over what is chlorine. We've gone over different types of chlorine used in treating uh, drinking water. And we're going to get to the most important aspect uh, or most important quality that chlorine has in treating uh, drinking water and making it potable. And we're going to enter into the term disinfection. So my next slide then poses a question, what is disinfection? Obviously you see pictures right there of, uh, of, of bacteria uh, under a microscope. What chlorine does is that it basically doesn't destroy bacteria. It, what it does is that it selectively inactivates pathogenic bacteria or organisms in the water by, by this chemical mean, the, the the addition of chlorine. Now, one thing that we want to make very clear, and I repeat, uh, disinfection is different from sterilization because sterilization is a complete destruction of all organisms found in water. And um, this is not done in potable water. And there's a good reason for it because it's it's very expensive. And, and when you really consider it, it's, it's unnecessary. So if somebody were to ask you, when you see chlorine in water, when you see a chlorine residual in water, does that mean that there's nothing alive in it? Well, not necessarily. It means that <clears throat> pretty much everything that's in it has been inactivated. In other words, the pathogenic organisms are still alive in that chlorine. They cannot reproduce. And that's basically what happens in your body. When you take in uh, by accident some type of pathogenic organism, well, what really harms you is not that there's one of them, let's just say that there's one uh, uh, cholera or dysentery microbe entering your body, it's when they start to reproduce. Because when they enter your body and they start to reproduce and they become many, that's when they wreak havoc on your system. And so what chlorine does is it inactivates those organisms so that they, they, they could either die, but more importantly, they cannot reproduce. So if you take in one of them, you dig it in, your system handles it, uh, perhaps your immune system attacks it, eliminates it, because it's only one. It doesn't overwhelm your, your organism. And then that's, that's how uh, chlorine is very beneficial because it disinfects the water. And what kind of uh, waterborne diseases are in, in drinking water or in untreated drinking water, better well said, that we need to disinfect? Well, take a look at this next slide. These are the different types of uh, waterborne diseases that are found in water. You see cholera, you see malaria, gastroenteritis, dysentery, giardia, uh, even hepatitis, salmonella. There's some that are even not even mentioned here, like cryptosporidium. And so when you disinfect the water with chlorine, you're basically inactivating these pathogenic organisms so that it doesn't cause disease to your, your organism persons. Or person. Now, its surface and groundwater contain sometimes several of these waterborne diseases. More, uh, more commonly, surface water. And what do I mean by surface water? 
Well, surface water is water that's in the ocean. It's water that's in a river. It's water that's in a lake. It's water that's in a canal that's basically exposed to the environment. Yeah, you have fish swimming in it. You have animals drinking out of it, bathing in it. So that type of surface water is going to contain more of these uh, bacteria. And that's why surface water is more prone to uh, carrying these types of diseases as opposed to groundwater. Now, when I say that, there's some groundwater that do not contain waterborne disease. That's groundwater that's not influenced by surface water because you may have a well and that well may be influenced or it may be supplied by a, by a nearby river or by a, or maybe the ocean is nearby or a lake. And so any groundwater directly under the, sur uh, the influence of surface water has a high probability that it contains a lot of these microorganisms. So what chlorine does is that uh, it kills these or it disables or inactivates these uh, microorganisms that kill thousands of people annually. And then for this reason, drinking water is treated with a disinfectant chlorine. And then uh, the primary goal of water treatment is to ensure that the water is potable. That is to say, it's safe to drink. It doesn't contain any disease causing microorganisms. And that's why we inject chlorine to, do, to basically inactivate all disease organ, uh, causing organisms in the water. And nowadays, uh, as I repeat, chlorine is the most common form of disinfection used in water treatment. Now, um, let's pop over to uh, the next slide. And this one asks the question, how does chlorine control microorganisms? Well, chlorine, like I said, it doesn't necessarily kill them, although I, um, that's a very general term. It does kill microorganisms, but more importantly, if it doesn't kill them, it inactivates them. And the way it does that is that it, it weakens the cell membranes of the microorganism. Remember, for the cell to survive, uh, for it to be able to, to breathe, um, the respiration process and the DNA activity inside of this bacterial membrane, the cell membrane is absolutely important. So what chlorine does, being an oxidizer, it comes in and it burns or it damages that cell membrane. And then chlorine enters the cell and disrupts uh, you know, the processes of uh, the normal processes of these cells, of these bacterial cells. And this leads to the inactivation of these uh, pathogenic microbes. And so once again, it's very effective in doing this, in activating microorganisms. And once again, uh, chlorine does not sterilize. And I keep repeating that because sometimes when you go in to take your level one uh, water treatment uh, certification, the exam will ask you specifically, does chlorine sterilize the water? And the answer is no, it does not sterilize the water. It disinfects the water because sterilization is a complete destruction of all of anything living in that water. And chlorine does not necessarily do that. But to effectively disinfect the water, time is very important. And that's why we get into the term contact time. So, <clears throat> I think is chlorine, uh, as I repeat, it's, it's a very highly reactive chemical and very highly toxic to living organisms, including ourselves, if it's in high concentrations in the water. So the presence of chlorine in water affects the bacteria. It affects the pathogens. It weakens them. It destroys their cellular membranes. So they, they're incapable of reproducing. In water, you have germs like uh, EV E. coli, which... Uh, will typically be destroyed in less than a minute of exposure to chlorine in water. So what I mean is that when you when you have, when you inject chlorine in water, it has to be in there for a certain amount of time to be effective in, in uh, rendering incapable these microorganisms. So I repeat, E. coli generally takes about a minute for it to be disabled in water. Um, hepatitis A, this virus will be destroyed in less than 15 minutes of exposure in water. There's a, there's a protozoan called Giardia, and this one takes about 45 minutes of exposure to chlorine before it's disabled or destroyed. So, and then on the other hand, you have a more resistant uh, microorganisms like Cryptosporidium. It's a, it's a protozoan that kind of protects itself in its own little crypt, uh, to put it in simple terms. Cryptosporidium needs to be exposed to 10 days of chlorine exposure. Uh, um, before, before it's disabled or, or, or killed. 
And that's why you want to have a chlorine residual in the drinking water. Okay, then just let me explain this picture. What you see there is, is, is a drinking water plant. And that's what's called that, that, uh, that tank that seems to have serpentine walls in it. That's a chlorine contact basin. And as water enters that tank, it, it travels in a serpentine fashion, which is, allows the chlorine to properly mix in the water. But these uh, tanks are built in such a way that the chlorine is going to be in contact with the water for a certain amount of time before it enters a distribution system. Generally, uh, it's about 30 minutes. Uh, more often than not, it is longer than that. But once again, contact time is important. I remember that when we were having this, uh, the pandemic, and they were talking about using, for instance, chlorine to uh, disinfect surfaces. And a lot of things, a lot of things, um, an issue that was being very made clear to the public was that, okay, if you're disinfecting the surface, it's just not a matter of, of getting liquid uh, chlorine in, in a spray bottle and then spraying that surface and then immediately wiping out, uh, wiping the surface dry. No, you got to let that chlorine sit. And the recommendation is to kill to kill the virus, it had to be at least 30 seconds. So you would spray the surface and then wait 30 seconds and then wipe it clean. And then the thinking is that in 30 seconds, you would effectively create enough contact time for that chlorine to kill the, uh, the virus. And the same thing, the same principle applies to water to the different pathogens. You gotta give that chlorine time to work because uh, if you don't give it time to work, then it won't, it won't disinfect the water. Okay, so once again, this is a bird's eye view of a, of a chlorine contact time. This is just a, a schematic of one, and you can see how the water moves in a serpentine fashion to the tank. And once again, what that allows is very good mixing of the water with the chlorine, and more importantly than anything, it, it, uh, it creates contact time. At least 30 minutes, uh, that water is gonna be in contact with chlorine to effectively kill the microorganisms. Um, there are some regulatory requirements that uh, surface water and groundwater need to meet, uh, which is very directly related to contact time to properly disinfect the, the water. Now, this next slide kind of shows these regulatory requirements. For instance, surface water must achieve a 99.9%, and no, notice it doesn't say destruction, it says inactivation. That's called a three log inactivation of Jardia. Now, Jardia lambda, remember we made mention, it usually leaves about 45 minutes of contact time before it is inactivated in water. And then it must achieve a 99.99% .99 inactivation of four log removal of viruses. And then groundwater is not as strict. It must achieve a 99.99% .99 treatment four log removal of viruses. But once again, these regulatory requirements are directly related to contact time of chlorine with water. And that way you, do, you effectively disable or inactivate these microorganisms. So we're going to enter into another term in this presentation called, uh, related to chlorination, and it's called breakpoint chlorination. So what is breakpoint chlorination? So if you look at this slide here, and you look at that chart on the slide, breakpoint chlorination is basically the process of adding chlorine to water until chlorine demand has been satisfied. Now, to explain this in the best possible way that I can, remember that chlorine is an oxidizer. It's gonna react with carbonaceous or organic uh, particles in the water. It's gonna burn them up, to put it in simple terms. So chlorine needs time to do that and it, and it needs a proper dose to do that. So you're gonna add chlorine to the water until you've basically reacted uh, with everything in the water and there's nothing left for that chlorine to react with. Once you reach that point where there's nothing in the, left in the water for that chlorine to react with, you get to breakpoint chlorination. Now, when you, reach, when you achieve breakpoint chlorination, what is your chlorine dose? Uh, or better well said, your chlorine residual in the water, generally it, it would be zero. It would be zero. And any chlorine added after that is gonna be directly proportionate of how much you're dosing. So let's just say that I was dosing the water at three parts per million concentration of chlorine. 
that chlorine goes into the water and it's going to react with everything in there. And that's called the demand. And then the demand, let's just say, is two. There's a demand for because there's so many particulates in the water, it's going to chew up two milligrams per liter of that chlorine. Once I hit that break point, which means uh, the moment where there's nothing left in the water for that chlorine to work against, to, to, to react with, then I've hit break point. And if I dosed it at three milligrams per liter and my demand is two milligrams per liter, then that means that I'm going to have a residual of one milligram per liter. And if I keep adding chlorine at three milligrams per liter, well, that chlorine is just going to continue to rise. It's going to go from one milligram per liter and it's going to continue to climb, decline, unless uh, I regulate my, my chlorine injection pump to, to maintain it at a, at a desired chlorine. So um, that's what you want to do with your drinking water. You want to reach breakpoint chlorination and a little bit beyond. Because once you hit breakpoint chlorination, there's a type of chlorine residual in the water that's called free available chlorine. Now, one question that, uh, that I want to pose to the audience is, are public water systems today chlorinated past breakpoint? And the answer is yes, they're all chlorinated past breakpoint. Why? Because once you achieve breakpoint, then you have what's called a chlorine residual that's leftover chlorine in the water. And what is that basically telling you? That when you test that water, say with a, with a DPD chemical reagent or with an amperometric uh, chlorine meter, and it shows that there's a residual in that water, what that's basically telling me that there was nothing left in that water for chlorine to react with. In other words, it disabled or destroyed everything that was in that water. And that's what I want to see in water. And that's why uh, regulations, the federal government, when uh, when uh, th they set these regulations for drinking water, they always want to see residual chlorine in the water because that means that there's nothing left uh, in that water that's gonna, that has reacted with that chlorine or to react with that chlorine and that could potentially harm the consumer. So <clears throat> we talked about um, breakpoint chlorination and the residual chlorination. The residual is basically found in the form of free chlorine. And what do we mean by that? Well, chlorine, when it reacts with water, it forms hypochlorous acid. It's acidic. And it also forms hypochlorite ion. Now, hypochloric acid <clears throat> disassociates to hydrogen and hypochlorite. But basically, these two ions, hypochlorous acid and hypochlorite ion, they form this free chlorine in the water. And that's the most effective form of chlorine residual that you can have in your water. You want to have free chlorine. And the reason that I make mention of this is many of you, once you come into the industry, you start working at a water municipality. You're going you're, you're gonna to have these chlorine test kits. And a lot of these test kits are, are DPD, <clears throat> which is a chemical reagent that we use. And that this DPD is, is some of these uh, little packets. Uh, they're rated for toll chlorine, some of them from combined chlorine, and others for flea chlorine. As concerns drinking water, you're going to be using free available chlorine packets, which you're going to be testing for this hypochlorous acid and hypochlorite ion. So, this is a slide that uh, a presenter, I actually pilfered it from him, but uh, he used this slide to help the students remember what free chlorine is composed of. It's, and he uses the term hockle and ockle. So it's a good way to think of dumb and dumber and then you think of hockle and ockle. These are the two main chemical species created by chlorine in water. So free chlorine is composed of hypochlorous acid, hockle, and hydrochloric acid, or hypochlorite ion, ockle. You just think of dumb and dumber, and then you remember it. And then one thing to remember is that hockle, in this case representing Jim Carrey in the slide, has 80 times greater disinfection potential than ockle. So you want to have more hockle in your water than you want to do ockle. And uh, that's just something that we need to remember. This is an important fact when it comes to chlorination. Potable water leaving a treatment plant must have a chlorine residual of at least two milligrams per liter. Five is recommended. But those are some of the things that might come out in your uh, treatment exams. They're going to say, what is a recommended residual leaving a water treatment plant? Well, the minimum is two milligrams per liter. 0.5 milligrams per liter and above is recommended. 
distribution system. Now that's different. That's not the water directly leaving the treatment plant. That's water found out uh, in the pipes, out in the neighborhoods of, of the customers. That uh, must have a detectable residual, at least 0 0.2 milligrams per liter. And once again, when you have residual, what that basically tells you that there's nothing in that water that's gonna harm uh, the consumer. <clears throat> These are the different, there are different factors that affect disinfection or the effectiveness of chlorine in water. One of them is pH, <clears throat> another one is temperature, another one is turbidity, and then the amount of organic uh, contact uh, content in the water. So how does pH affect uh, drinking water? Well, remember that chlorine, free chlorine, is composed of hockel, which is hypochlorous acid. So when we're talking about acid on the pH scale, acid is anything below seven. <clears throat> so when your pH is below seven, that alcohol is very effective. Remember, alcohol is 80% or 80 times more effective than hypochlorite ion. Hypochlorite ion, it operates above 7.0. And as, as, as is stated in the, in the facts in a previous slide, hypochlorite ion is not as effective. So as... As the pH increases in water, that is to say, as it becomes up higher above seven, your chlorine is less effective. As the pH decreases in water, your chlorine becomes more effective. So to put it in simple terms, at a pH of seven, your chlorine in the water is more effective than at a pH of eight. So that's just something to keep in mind for treatment plant operators, that they want to keep their their uh, pH in the water as close to a neutral or slightly below neutral and neutral to seven as possible to make uh, their chlorine as effective as possible. Another factor <clears throat> that affects uh, disinfection is turbidity. And what do I mean by turbidity? It's basically the clarity of the water. Now, you can see in this slide, there's several beakers here. And starting with the first beaker, that has a very low turbidity. That means that there's hardly any particulates in that water. And as the turbidity rises, you see there's more particles. You see that? And I'm in my third beaker and my fourth beaker, and then you have a high turbidity. That's very murky water. Excessive turbidity reduces the efficiency of chlorination. Why? Because these... Uh, this water, this murky water with these particulates in it, it bacteria tends to hide in these uh, in these particulates. So as the chlorine comes in contact with the water, well, what's going to happen is that uh, the bacteria will hide in these particulates, and the chlorine can't effectively uh, effectively reach the bacteria or the pathogens. And then that's why it renders uh, turbidity renders uh, chlorination uh, ineffective. Uh, I work at, for instance, some operators that work at wastewater plants, they know, for, for example, that if they're trying to pass a, a fecal, a fecal sample of the effluent leaving the wastewater plant, the clearer that effluent is, that is, the less uh, uh, turbidity it has, the less particulates it has, well, the higher the, higher the percentage that that sample is going to pass, as it's not going to have colony forming units because there's nothing for that those uh, pathogens to hide in. And the same thing happens when you're treating water, drinking water. You want to remove as much turbidity through chemical and filtration means as possible. And when you add chlorine to the water, the clearer it is, the more effectively you're going to disinfect it because the bacteria have nowhere to hide. And the chlorine is going to come into direct contact with them. Now, <clears throat> there's a statement right here at the bottom of the slides that the most effective chlorination occurs at a turbidity, which is the clarity of the water, of one NTU or less. So the less turbid your water, <clears throat> the more effective your chlorination. And then I mentioned uh, organics. So organics, remember that chlorine is an oxidizer. So the more organics that you're going to have in the water, the more chlorine you're going to need to burn those, that carbonaceous, that organic material up. So once again, this is directly also related to turbidity that you want to make sure that the water you're treating has a lot of this organic matter and particulates. Now, I mentioned organic because uh, it could also, it could be particulates, but it could also be dissolved organics. And the higher the concentration of these organics and one of the more chlorine you're going to need to disinfect it, because it's going to create such a high demand for chlorine that you're not going to be able to produce a residual. So 
The goal is remove as many organics in the water as you possibly can. There's going to be a presenter later on in this uh, webinar that's going to talk about why organics in the water is uh, very important when it comes to potable water treatment. Because organics in the water, when they react with chlorine, they also form a, a very a harmful substance called trihalomethanes. So you do not want to have a lot of organics in your in your water prior to treating it uh, for for drinking water use. And so we've already discussed and uh, factors that affect uh, chlorination, <clears throat> but how do we measure? What are methods of measuring chlorine with water? Well, there's two main methods. And one of them is colorimetric, and the other one is amperometric. They're both very efficient. Um, colorimetric, in, in many ways, is a little less expensive to use than amperometric. Amperometric is very uh, convenient because it's an online meter that's giving you real-time data as far as the amount of chlorine in your water. Where colorimetric, sometimes you actually have to take a grab sample, put a reagent in it, and uh, and then test it to see that it was hit on the water. This is a slide. The next slide gives a, uh, a good indication of what the colorimetric uh, method for measurement of chlorine in the water. This is a colorimetric DPD method. The long-time standard for chlorine measurement uh, is based on this reagent. Now, if I pronounce Forgive me if I don't pronounce this correctly. DPD is pronounced diethyl phenylidiamine, which reacts with uh, the free chlorine in the water, and it forms a colored product. In this, in this case, it's, it turns pink. And then the more chlorine in the water, the darker pink or even red that that, uh, that, that DPD is going to, to turn. And so uh, whenever you're measuring drinking water, once again, you want to have a residual. That little pink color tells you that you have residual chlorine in the water, which meant that your chlorine reacted with everything in the water and there's nothing left for it to react with, meaning that that water is now safe to drink. So just looking at that, uh, that vial, I would say that's about, that's between 0 0.5 to maybe one milligrams per liter of chlorine residual. Okay, so that's the colorimetric DPD method. What about the amperometric? <clears throat> well, this is a, a Hawk amperometer. And this is very different from the colorimetric because it doesn't necessarily use a reagent. What it uses is two electrodes. So you can see uh, <clears throat> one of the electrodes is in here and the ele other electrode is in this uh, cylinder right here. And what this actually does is that it measures a change in the current caused by the chemical reduction of hypochlorous acid at one of these electrodes particularly the cathode, because you're going to have an anode, which is a negative, and a positive, a cathode. So <clears throat> as the current, as the water flows through in it and the current fluctuates, well, this reduction in current is proportional to the chlorine concentration. So then uh, this little mechanism will interpret it into a chlorine level. A lot of the newer uh, wastewater plants, a lot of the larger wastewater, I mean, uh, wastewater, I'm saying water treatment plants, they will use these amperometric um, uh, methods of, of chlorination because uh, especially if you're tied into some type of computer system like a SCADA system that has to record every 15 minutes of what the actual chlorine residual leaving a facility is well these are very useful because every 15 minutes these will render a reading that will be then recorded on that uh, that computer database which confirm that at any given moment during the day that the water had chlorine leaving the plant well, I think that's a lot of information so far for this morning, right? I hope that uh, that we're able to retain most of it. Let's just go over some of the facts that we learned today. Remember that chlorine residual in the water should be no less than 0 0.2 milligrams per liter at all times at the furthest points of the distribution system. So <clears throat> if you operate a, a water treatment plant, and you have to take uh, what's called a total coliform sample, which is a sample that determines if there's any, any bacteria left alive in that water. If you're taking that sample at the farthest point of the distribution from your water treatment plant, it is expected that your residual be no less than 0 0.2. And if it is no, if it is no less than 0 0.2, then uh, you're doing a good job as a water treatment operator because you're removing all the turbidity you're removing all the organics from the water, you're controlling your pH, and that's why at the farthest point, you still have a chlorine residual. So you're making sure that the customers 
in that cul-de-sac at the farthest point of your of your distribution system is still being delivered safe water that doesn't have any active microorganisms or any particulars in there that will cause cause any issues and and then again remember i said just as chlorine is bad for microorganisms it's also bad for humans so the residual should never exceed the chlorine maximum contaminant level of four milligrams per liter of water so that's another thing that we as uh, treatment operators have to be very conscious of is that once we achieve that breakpoint chlorination you better make sure that that chlorine never gives above 4.0 because at 4.0, then you're disinfecting humans, and we don't want to do that. We want to just make sure that that chlorine is safe uh, to drink. And if you keep chlorine basically within 0 0.5 to about one milligrams per liter, um, you don't get that chlorine. You generally won't get that chlorine smell in the water. You won't have customers calling in to the main office saying, "Hey, you know what? There's a, there's a chlorine smell in the water. You're adding too much chlorine to the water." It's basically non-detectable, <clears throat> but uh, anything above that, especially once you get near that four milligrams per liter uh, range, you're going to have uh, customer complaints because people can then smell the chlorine in the water, and then nobody wants to to be e e nobody likes that chlorine smell, and even more, nobody wants to be drinking water with a lot of chlorine in it. Well, I'm checking my time right now on. Uh, <laughs> It looks like we've used the most of the hour that we had this morning for this presentation. I think we have maybe a couple minutes for some questions. So uh, does anybody have any questions regarding uh, the information that was presented in this first portion of the uh, of the webinar so far? There's a chat at the bottom of your yes. open session on GoToWebinar that will help you. You want to comment on that, Ebony? I do. Well, it looks like we have a few questions coming in. Um, let's start with Tina. Uh, what is the benefit of using 5% sodium hypochlorite versus 5% bleach? Okay, 5% hypochlorite doesn't have a lot of the stabilizers that bleach has. So bleach, um, bleach is gonna be very stable, but generally 5% hypochlorite is gonna, it doesn't have uh, some preservatives that uh, a bleach container will have. Bleach is generally not recommended for drinking water. It's not. I don't want you to quote me on this, but I don't think it has NSF approval to be used for drinking water purposes. It will disinfect your water, but it's not generally recommended. And remember, bleach is generally 3%. <clears throat> Very rarely are you going to have, find a bleach on the supermarket or Walmart shelf that is going to be a 5%. And then to repeat, <clears throat> the 5% is very stable. It doesn't lose its concentration as quickly as a 12 to 15% sodium hypochlorite. Well, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Joe. We've got a few more. Is the 0 0.2 milligrams per liter TRC app applicable to points of use? Yes, it is applicable to points of use. So, uh, <clears throat> but it just de depends. Um, a point of use is is generally where the drinking water enters the distribution system. Now, remember, a lot of the points of use are basically the, from the treatment plant. The minute it exits the treatment plant into the distribution system, that's considered a point of use or a point of entry. <clears throat> and to repeat, you can't have that chlorine residual go below 0.2. Uh, in that point of entry, because once it reaches the far point of that distribution system, more than likely, you're not going to have any chlorine residual left. Because remember, chlorine is affected. It's affected by temperature. It's affected by time. And chlorine just degrades. Maybe it takes a couple of days to reach the far end of the distribution system. And at that point, all that turbulence in the water causes that chlorine to, to off gas in the water, and then you have no more chlorine residual left. So uh, it does apply to those points of use. And, and, and when operators go to different parts of the distribution system to take samples, these coliform samples, they are points of use. And they are uh, required to report what the chlorine residual was at those points of use. And generally, they, they want to see a 0 0.2 milligrams per liter or higher. OK. I think we've got time for um, one more question. But then we'll, we can probably take some more in a, another hour. Um, how do you keep the pH near neutral? Okay, <clears throat> that is a very good question because pH, especially, um, a lot of it depends on the source water. If you're dealing with surface water, water coming from uh, 
from a lake or from the, the, ocean, um, the ocean or, or even a canal or river, it's going to be closer to neutral. <clears throat> the challenge that you have is with uh, groundwater. Most of the groundwater, especially here in the valley, has a pH of eight and above. And what a lot of treatment plants do is that they add a chemical to drop the, TP, the pH. They'll either add sulfuric acid or even citric acid to the water to drop that pH to be able to get it down to, to, to uh, an acceptable level. Sometimes you can get away with it at a treatment plant because the treatment plants, they use uh, certain chemicals <clears throat> to remove the turbidity. We discussed that in some of the slides that you have to reduce, uh, remove the organics and the turbidity and you use, use coagulating chemicals. <clears throat> One of them is, um, is, is aluminum sulfate. And aluminum sulfate, interestingly enough, is acidic in nature. So when it comes in contact with water, it drops the pH. So a lot of the water treatment plants that I've worked with, if you're working with aluminum sulfate or even ferric chloride is another one of these coagulant chemicals, <clears throat> they will, in effect, just do the dosing to remove the turbidity they will drop the pH of the water to make it at a more effective level for the, then the treat that that filter water, that coagulated water that has removed these particulates. Once it gets touched up with chlorine, it's at an acceptable pH. Awesome. Thank you very much, Joe. We do have a few more questions. Do you think you might have time to squeeze them in or should we wait till after sure. you pull? Okay. Um, just from Laura, Lori, thank you all for your questions so far. Uh, which is more accurate, uh, the color metric or the, ooh, the amper metric? I've not seen that word. And does an amper metric require a lot of maintenance? Please correct me if I'm saying that. I thought for the longest time that the amper metric was a more accurate form of treatment because it's also more expensive. And then <clears throat> you do have to have a qualified technician to come in and calibrate that, that unit of measurement. But there was a recent, a recent article in, uh, in uh, one of these water treatment publications in which a study was conducted between the two, comparing the, the, uh, the accuracy of both of them, and they're very comparable. So a statement can't be made where the DPD method is less accurate than the amperometric method or vice versa. The only advantage of the amperometric method is that you can use it online. So there's a lot of treatment facilities that they have to have a chlorine residual reading every 15 minutes. So for an operator to be <clears throat> going to the laboratory or to a point of use and, and sampling that water every 15 minutes is not very effective use of resources or time. And that's where you would have an amperometric meter because that meter would just give you a real time reading of that chlorine. But uh, no, there, there are articles out there that, that have conducted these tests or these comparisons, and and basically the final result is that that they're both uh, fairly accurate. They're both very comparable, and it just depends on the application that you're going to be using them for, or uh, or that that you're going to want to implement either the color metric or the amperometric method. Perfect. One more question for the small water systems: Can you use bleach for very small drinking water systems? <laughs> Some. Some do, but it's not recommended. Um, don't leave this webinar saying, hey, you know what? Uh, the, uh, the instructor said we could use bleach. I am not saying that you can use bleach. Uh, bleach, remember, is a, is, is a weaker concentration of chlorine also, so you're not going to be guaranteed to properly disinfect your water. And so just to put an actual, for drinking water purposes, no, do not use bleach. Use NSF approved drinking water hypochlorite or the tablets or the chlorine gas. All right, perfect. Um, why don't we go ahead and go into the chemical dosing? And if we have time after that, we'll cover some more questions. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Just give me a couple of minutes to bring up my slide. No worries. And to anyone who has asked questions after the fact, we will be sending these questions to Joe, and he can reach out to you directly, or he can comprise a, a list for us that we can send out. For anyone who's just joining us, we are going to jump into uh, the next presentation, also presented by Joe, which is chemical dosing. And we'll be having a break a little bit um, 
at 10, excuse me. Okay, <clears throat> Ebony, can everybody see my chemical dosing math screen? I can see your presentation screen. Okay, very good. So let's begin. <clears throat> okay, so um, I already went ahead and introduced myself for those who are barely joining the, the webinar. Once again, my name is Joe Cornejo, and I am an associate with KUV Consultants, and uh, I am also a treatment uh, plant operator by any other term. Uh, it's it's my passion. I've been in the industry for over 30 years. I, I have a lot of fun uh, preparing webinars like this. And, and as a matter of fact, every time that I do so, I always learn something new. You probably, you, there, was a, there was a question posed to me in the, in the previous, uh, in the previous um, uh, slideshow in which a student asked me of the comparison between colorimetric and parametric uh, chlorine readings. And uh, that was one of the questions that when I was actually preparing the slides, I asked myself, I go, which, which one of the two is more effective? And I was able to look up some information that let me know that uh, they basically compared the same. At the equal. I thought, well, that's new information that I can go and uh, not only benefit myself with, but also share with, with some of the students that are <clears throat> participating in the webinars or some of the classes that, that we teach. Well, now, um, this is a very good transition uh, from chlorination into chemical dosing math because uh, chemical dosing math we're going to get into the basics of it uh, and the learning objectives of this uh, of this portion of the webinar is is basically to focus on chlorine dose and demand <clears throat> and then what's called the pounds formula to determine uh, chemical concentrations so once again, I'm going to repeat, we're not going to get into some really high level uh, type of uh, problems, but we're going to cover the basics of these two uh, chemical dosing principles, chlorine dose and demand and the pounds formula. So why don't we just go ahead and get into it and let's talk about chlorine demand or dose formula. Now, some of you that were uh, <clears throat> already connected to the, uh, to the first slideshow, that had to do with chlorination and drinking water, I made mention of chlorine dose and demand and residual in the water. And in very simple terms, what you're seeing on the screen right here, this is the basic formula to determine what your chlorine demand is, what your dose should be based on your residual. And remember, in drinking water, we always want to have a residual. And I repeat, the residual, the recommended residual is 0 0.2 at the furthest points of your distribution system. The way this formula works is very straightforward. What your dose is right here, where you see my cursor, what your dose is, what you start off with. So let's just say that I'm dosing the water at three milligrams per liter. That's what I've set my chlorine pump to dose at. <clears throat> I'm telling you, I want you to add three milligrams per liter dose to this drinking water. The, uh, the water still has maybe some particulates in it and it has pathogens. <clears throat> That's composed of organic matter. It's carbonaceous in nature. So chlorine is going to react with that. That's where the demand comes in. So that three milligrams per liter dose, maybe that water has a demand such that two milligrams per liter of that three milligrams per liter is going to be consumed. Now, chlorine is a very interesting chemical, and I kind of touched on this in my previous slideshow. Chlorine, when it comes in contact with carbonaceous matter, it cancels itself out. Some, the best way that I try to illustrate this to students when I'm teaching uh, <clears throat> water treatment courses is that chlorine to me is like a bumblebee. You know, a bumblebee is very interesting because a bumblebee is very different from a wasp because a wasp can sting you many times. There was a time that I was coming down from Payson and I was on my motorcycle and I was coming down 89. And uh, as I was coming down, a wasp flew between my helmet and my jacket and it went down straight into my jacket. And as I was going 70 miles per hour down the hill, that wasp was just going to town on my chest and it stung me about seven times before I could stop the motorcycle and then uh, and deal with it. But a bumblebee is very different. See, a bumblebee, when it stings you, it dies. It can only sting you once. 
And in very simple terms, chlorine is the same. You have a chlorine molecule. When it comes in contact with a particulate in the water, it, it cancels itself out. It, it disappears. It, 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 it self-destructs along with causing damage to whatever carbonaceous matter it comes in contact with. And that's, that's where the demand principle when you're dosing when chlorine applies is that chlorine, when it comes in contact with something, <clears throat> it's going to basically self-destruct when it's oxidizing any type of carbonaceous matter. And that's where your demand comes in. Sometimes you're hoping that what you're adding to the water in the form of dose <clears throat> is always going to be greater than the amount needed for the demand, the amount needed to react with whatever carbonaceous organic matters in that water, therefore leaving you a residual. So chlorine dose <clears throat> minus the demand is always going to equal the residual chlorine. And inversely, you could move this calculation around to, to figure out demand or dose. And, and we're going to get into it in some further slides. But Getting into this uh, chlorine demand and dose uh, problem, once again, I repeat, dose is what you start off with. <clears throat> demand is what the chlorine actually reacted in the water with, leaving you a residual. So if I had three chlorine molecules in the water reacting with two organic particulates in the water, that's going to leave me with one chlorine molecule left. <clears throat> Some of the best ways, and I try to illustrate it to some of the students in these courses, is that, like your presenter, I really like hot dogs, okay? Uh, I really do. They're one of my favorite foods. So I try to illustrate it, it in these terms. Let's just say that your presenter, Joe Cornejo, he basically bought three hot dogs, right? Remember, I love hot dogs, and I bought three of them, and I'm hoping to eat all three of them. But you know what, at my age now, and I'm, uh, I'm close to 50 years old, my eyes are bigger than my stomach. And sometimes I buy more food than I can actually eat. So I compare that, my hunger to the demand. So instead of eating three hot dogs, I only ate two hot dogs. And then, so how many hot dogs do I have left? Well, I have one. And it's the very same easy basic principle when it comes to chlorine demand or dose. Dose is what you start off with. Demand is how much you actually use up in the water, how much chlorine reacts in the water, and residual is what you have left. In simple terms, I started off with three hot dogs, my stomach only demanded two, and I was left with one. So uh, if, any, if very, anybody's ever sharing hot dogs with me, you better hope that, I, that I, uh, my eyes are still bigger than my stomach because there's going to be a residual hot dog left for me to share with you. But in simple terms, that's the chlorine demand or dose formula. So why don't we get into trying to, to practice how this formula works. Okay, so once again, <clears throat> this, is, this is a typical problem that you're going to see like on an examination. The chlorine dose is three milligrams per liter. The demand is, is uh, two milligrams per liter. What is your residual? So Ignore my plus sign between the 3.0 to the 2.0 because it's actually a typo. It should be a minus. But dose minus demand is going to give me residual. So if I take 3 milligrams per liter and I subtract 2 milligrams per liter, which is a demand, which is, once again, what reactive with whatever organic material was in the water, I'm going to be left with 1 milligram per liter. So 3 hot dogs is what you bought. You actually ate 2 hot dogs. And you're just left with one. It's as simple as that. That is the chlorine residual uh, calculation. So inversely, remember, what if, uh, what if I know what I initially dosed the water with? So let's say that I dosed it with three milligrams per liter. And then I take my, my either my color metric or my parametric method of measuring the chlorine. And I see that I have a residual of one milligram per liter. So the question is posed, what was your demand? Well, if my dose was three milligrams per liter and I have one milligram per liter residual left in the water, well, that would mean very simply that my demand was two milligrams per liter. And, and, and this applies in, in, in all these chlorine dose and demand calculations is as simple as that. 
sometimes when, uh, as operators, we see this, this slide right here, we get a little confused. We think, oh my God, this is a lot more complicated than what I thought. But really, when you break it down in simple terms, it's very easy to understand. <clears throat> Remember, chlorine demand is how much is used. So in that first calculation there, the demand plus the residual is going to give me what I originally started off with. So let's just say that the demand was two, and I have two milligrams per liter was my demand, and I have one milligram per liter residual left. Well, my chlorine dose was three milligrams per liter. And if my chlorine dose, and this is the second calculation on this slide, if my chlorine dose was three and my residual was one, what was my demand? Well, very logically, it was two milligrams per liter. And if my chlorine dose, once again, was, uh, was three and my demand was two, well, the residual is going to be one. It's as simple as that. So let's get into one of these problems. This is a very basic chlorine demand problem. Okay, well, we're gonna we're gonna read the problem very carefully. This is the chlorine demand of a water is 1.6 milligrams per liter. So I repeat, what is demand? Demand is how much chlorine is gonna react with the organic material in the water. It's not your dose, it's how much is actually gonna react, it's not what you're starting off with. If the desired chlorine residual is 0 0.5 milligrams per liter, what was the chlorine dose in milligrams per liter? Very good question. So if we go back to our formula, <clears throat> say dose, it says minus residual is gonna get, um, minus demand is gonna give you residual. So in this case, if, if the demand is 1.6, I'm sorry, but let, me, let me rephrase that. Chlorine demand plus residual is going to give me my initial dose. Okay, so let's go back. The chlorine demand is 1.6, the residual is 0.5. What is the dose? What we're going to do is that uh, we're going to add 1.6, which was a demand, plus 0.5. And if you have your calculator out, you could even do it in your head. The very simple answer is going to be 2.1 milligrams per liter. And if you were to flip that around, 2.1 minus 1.6, which is a demand, is going to give you a residual of 0 0.5. Always ask my students, is that clear? Clear as mud? I don't think you could get any clearer than this. Okay, let's try practicing another question on here. It says the chlorine dose of the water is 2.1 milligrams per liter. If the desired chlorine residual is 0 0.5, what is the chlorine demand in milligrams per liter? So once again, we go to our dose minus demand equals residual problem. And this is the answer. 2.1, which is your original dose, minus your residual is going to give you 1.6 milligrams per liter. That was a demand. So when I dose that water at 2.1, there was enough organics in that water to chew up 1.6 milligrams per liter of that chlorine, such that at the farthest point of the distribution system, how much chlorine do I have left? 0 0.5. So that is an, an easy way to use the uh, chlorine dosage plus demand calculation. It's very straightforward. If, uh, <clears throat> if we lay it out in linear, simple terms, it's, it's very easy to figure out. So don't let this, um, don't let this type of slide confuse you, especially when you get your formula sheets, when you're taking your certification exams. It usually presents itself in this form. Um, a lot of what confuses you is this verbiage here. But if you use the example of the hot dogs, it's a lot easier to figure it out. Okay, I assume that there's going to be some very good questions at the end of this, uh, <clears throat> of this uh, slideshow regarding this formula. Okay, now we're going to answer uh, the, the meat of this webinar. Now, this is a Davidson pie chart. This was invented by a fellow by the last name of Davidson. He's an engineer. And um, this is a very interesting formula because it allows you to figure out concentrations of, uh, of chemical in water. And that chemical could be chlorine. It could be aluminum sulfate. It could be ferric chloride. It could be a, a lot of things. So just for the purposes of this webinar, since we're already talking about chlorine, we're going to use chlorine 
as a, as a dosage chemical in this calculation. Now, this Davidson pie is not really a pie. It's not tasty, and sometimes it's a little bit uh, a little bit hard to figure out for uh, for some operators how it works. But <clears throat> I'm going to explain it to you in the clearest terms. Pounds, okay? This is pounds of dry chemical. So pounds of dry chemical equals flow in million gallons. And what I mean by million gallons is that when you write down million gallons in this formula, <clears throat> if I were to really take a sheet of paper and then someone says, Joe, uh, write out one million uh, the number one million on that sheet of paper. Well, I'm going to put one and then I'll put six zeros behind that one. Well, this formula calls for million gallon flow in decimal form. So instead of just to put it in simple terms, let's say that my flow is two million gallons. As concerns this formula, I'm not going to put two with six zeros behind it in this formula because it's going to totally skew my answer. I'm going to put it in million gallon form. So instead of two with six zeros, I'm going to put 2.0 million gallons. And that's going to plug into that formula. Sometimes the formula is going to say 100,000 gallons. Well, 100,000 gallons is less than a million gallons. So you have to convert that to decimal form, which means that in this formula, I'm not going to write down 100 with five zeros behind it. I'm going to convert it to decimal form. And how do I do that? I take 100,000 in my calculator. That would be a one with five zeros behind it. And I'm going to divide. I'm going to divide that by one million, which is a one with six zeros behind it. And you know what I'm going to get? I'm going to get a 0 0.1 answer, and that's 0 0.1 million gallons. A hundred thousand gallons is equivalent to 0 0.1 million gallons. As concerns this formula, one million gallons is 1.0. That's how I would write it in this formula. 2 million gallons, it's not going to be 2 with zig zeros behind it. It's going to be 2.0 million gallons. Okay, so we just got to make that very clear as concerns <clears throat> this pounds formula. The million gallon portion of the formula <clears throat> is always going to be written in million gallon decimal form. Okay, the dosage is very clear. The dosage is going to be in milligrams per liter. And then perhaps you're asking yourself, <clears throat> where does this 8? 0.34 number come from? Well, 8.34 is a standard weight of a gallon of water. This number in this formula generally will never change. Why? Because a gallon of water generally always weighs 8.34 pounds. And you're using that pounds weight because your final answer is going to be in dry pounds. Okay, so flow in million gallons times the dosage in milligrams per liter times 8.34 pounds per gallon will give me dry pounds. And I'm gonna illustrate to you what this formula actually literally does for you in, in, in a slide. But here you can see once again, <clears throat> that flow times dosage in milligrams per liter times 8.34 is gonna equal pounds, okay? This is the pounds formula as concerned water treatment. <clears throat> See, we treatment operators, we don't use the Davidson pie. We don't say, hey, uh, are you using the, no, we say, hey, uh, the pounds formula or the pie chart. That's what it's generally used at. So to put it in visual terms, this is what it looks like. <clears throat> if I were to write it out linearly, this is in circular format, a pie format. What it basically means is that million gallons would go here, million gallons times dose, times 8.34 is going to equal pounds, just like this. Okay, I repeat, flow in million gallons times dose in milligrams per liter times 8.34, which is what a gallon of water weighs, is going to give me dry pounds. Okay, <clears throat> you're seeing this image on your screen, and that's an image of a portable water storage tank. Okay. <clears throat> Let's just say that that storage tank holds 2 million gallons. Now, you, you notice how I wrote it out? I didn't write it out with a two with six zeros behind it. I wrote it out as 2 million gallons. 
if I were that's that's the same as if I would have put 2.0 million gallons. <clears throat> so I just want to stress: do not write out the literal million gallon uh, number. You write it out in decimal million gallon form. It's two million gallons is 2.0 mg or two. And then you see that this tank holds a concentration of 1.5 milligrams per liter of corn. That's what that's what the residual in this clank is. So how many pounds of dry chlorine is actually in this tank? And that's what the neat thing of this, <clears throat> this formula does. Is it, it's as if I got a, a distiller and I distilled all that 2 million gallon volume. And all I was left with in this tank was dry chlorine that I initially added. You know how chlorine comes in dry form, it comes in a tablet form, it comes in powder form? Well, if I were to, using this formula, it's if, it, if I evaporated all the water out and I just had dry pounds at the bottom of that tank. And based on that 1.5 milligram per liter concentration, it will allow me to know how many dry pounds of chlorine I actually added. Now, this is very important because remember, I may mention that a chlorine cylinder holds 150 pounds of actual chlorine. The serum itself weighs about 300 pounds, but it, inside of it, there's actually about 150 pounds of chlorine. You put that cylinder on a scale. And then now uh, let's just say that you install a brand new chlorine cylinder. And then when you weigh it, the tear weight says 150 pounds. You set that chlorinate that chlorinator on top of that cylinder at um, <clears throat> let's say at 10 pounds of chlorine dose per day, 10 pounds of chlorine injection. So you come back the next day, and then that scale, instead of saying 150 pounds, it's going to read 140 pounds because you injected 10 pounds of chlorine. Now here's where the form comes in. Then you use that pounds formula to determine, okay, during a 24 hour time period, <clears throat> how much water in million gallons of water did I treat with 10 pounds of chlorine? So using the pounds formula, you can use those 10 pounds plus the volume to determine what your chlorine dose actually is. And that's the fun thing about it. Okay, we're going to have to practice in how to do this, but I hope everybody understands uh, the whole premise behind this, uh, the Davidson pie or the Pounds formula. You're basically taking a water, uh, a volume of water, and it's as if you're distilling all the water out, and then you're just left with the dry pounds. Uh, I work at, uh, I work with some of the guys up there in Baghdad, Arizona, and some of them are connected to the seminar, and they use a, uh, a tablet coordinator. And then uh, one of the operators that works at one of these facilities, he'll fill this chlorinator on a weekly basis with all these tablets. The chlorinator is, uh, it sits on a scale and you get a digital readout of the weight of those tablets on that chlorinator. And so he could put <clears throat> all, he could fill it up with these chlorine tablets and then he can come back the next day and he's going to see the digital readout on that scale. That's going to be a lot less. And what it let him know is how many pounds of dry tablets were dissolved and actually treated that water, and he could use that, those pounds of dry dissolved uh, that weight to determine what his actual chlorine dose was going into the water. That's that's a fascinating thing of this pounds formula. Let's see how we do that. <clears throat> okay, this is this is uh, our first problem that we're going to go over, and the thing is, it's asking me to calculate the chlorine dose, <clears throat> and notice how the pro the problem is formulated. It says a 2 million gallon portable water storage tank needs to be chlorinated at 1.5 milligrams per liter of chlorine residual. Now the question that is asked of us is how many pounds of chlorine will be needed to achieve this chlorine residual? So once again, we go back, remember we're, we're putting our, our tablets in there or we're putting our, our gas chlorine, if we still use gas chlorine on the scale, and so we filled up our two million gallon tank. And then when we went and got our color metric DPD meter and we took a sample of the water in that tank, it measured 1.5 milligrams per liter of chlorine residual. So then how many pounds of dry chlorine are in that tank? How many pounds did I actually put in? 
this is what that formula is going to allow me to figure it out. So let's let's work it. And I hope everybody that uh, is connected to this webinar has their calculator on their phone or, or just a calculator in front of them that's going to allow them to calculate this. <clears throat> now, once again, this is our, our Davidson pie. So what do we know so far in this math problem? Well, they give us a volume in million gallons, see? Two million gallons is the, the volume of your storage tank. When you went ahead and took that DPD chlorine residual from the sample that you took from that tank, that sample says that you have a 1.5 milligram per liter chlorine residual in that water sitting inside that tank. And then we know that a gallon of, a gallon of water, it weighs 8.34 pounds. So if I were to write it out, in linear fashion, it would be 2 million gallons times 1.5 milligrams per liter times 8.34 is going to equal 25 pounds of dry chlorine that was injected into that tank to receive a, a 1.5 residual. So why don't you take some time, <clears throat> take your calculator, and please, I want you to do that. I want you to take 2 million gallons times 1.5 milligram per liter dosage times 8.34. And what does that equal? Well, if you calculated the way I did on my phone, it equals 25.02 dry pounds of chlorine. So if we just round it off, it's 25 pounds. That's, <clears throat> that's how easy this pi formula is. So when you're looking at this, at this pi, you want to think of the 2 million gallons, the 1.5 milligrams per liter, and the 8.34 in linear, written out in linear terms. <clears throat> so the million gallons times the milligrams per liter times the 8.34 is going to give me 25 dry pounds. Excuse me. So what we've basically done is with this formula is that we've evaporated all the water out of that 2 million gallon tank. And all that was left was 25 pounds of dry chlorine. And that 25 pounds of dry chlorine, when it mixed with that 2 million gallons of water, it gave me a chlorine concentration or a residual of 1.5 milligrams per liter. Very good. Let's move into the next problem. <clears throat> Calculate the chlorine dose. <clears throat> and here we read a 2 million gallon portable water storage tank was filled at a chlorinator setting of 25 pounds per day. What should the final chlorine residual in the tank, what is a final chlorine residual in the tank in milligrams per liter? So now things have changed. So here, it's letting me know the final result. It says that I have 25 pounds of dissolved chlorine in that tank. <clears throat> so that meant that the operator came in the morning and then he set his chlorinator at a certain rate. And within a 24 hour time period, he dissolved 25 pounds of chlorine in a volume of 2 million gallons. So if he knows how many pounds he dissolved in 2 million gallons, According to the formula, what is his chlorine residual? What is his chlorine concentration in that tank? And look how neat this is. So here we are. What do we know so far, according to this math problem, that we could plug into our Davidson pi or our pound formula? Well, we know the volume of the tank, and that's why you put 2 million gallons per day. That's what we know. We know that we dissolved 25 pounds in a day, so we plug that into that and that's at the top of the pie. We know that a gallon of water always weighs 8.34 pounds. What we don't know is a milligrams per liter concentration. So here's where things change. That 25 pounds per day, it gets divided by all the divisors at the bottom of that formula. So what that basically means now is that 25 pounds per day divided by 2 million gallons a day divided by 8.34 is going to give me the milligrams per liter concentration. 
So can we please take some time and take our calculators and do that? Let's do it together. <clears throat> we're gonna take 25 pounds per day and we're not gonna multiply. We're gonna divide it this time by 2 million gallons. And we're gonna divide it again by 8.34, which is the pounds of weight of a gallon of water. And when I hit the equal sign, I'm gonna get a 1.49 milligram per liter. Round it off, 1.5 milligram per liter concentration. And that's how easy and that's how <clears throat> that's how neat this this formula is. Now I want you to do something, right? Like that you're on there on there. We already we already what if we didn't know the uh, the actual weight of a gallon of water? We do. That never changes in the formula, it's always a given. But if you were to do this, if you were to take, now follow me, I want you to put 25 on your calculator, which is a pounds per day. And I want you to divide that by 2 million gallons per day, which was a volume. And I want you to divide that again by, by 1.5 milligrams per liter, which was the known dose. And when you hit the equal sign, you're going to get 8.33333, which means round it off 8.34 pounds. So it's interchangeable. So when you know all the factors at the bottom of the pounds formula, when you multiply those factors, as we did in this previous calculation, when you multiply them all together, you get the final result in pounds. <clears throat> but if you know your pounds, but you don't know, let's just say, how many, you don't know your volume in million gallons, as long as I know two of the factors in the bottom of the formula, <clears throat> let's just say that I know the 1.5 milligrams per liter and the 8.34, I can figure out what the volume was that I treated. So why don't, we could actually do that. Why don't we do that here? Why don't we take, <clears throat> this time, uh, I want you to take your calculator again, and I want you to put 25, because we already know that we dose 25 pounds in a day. <clears throat> and I want you to divide it by 1.5 milligrams per liter because that's what that's what our final result came. So we know the, the residual. And I want you to divide that by 8.34. And then what do you get? You get a 1.99, which is your volume. So you see how interchangeable that is? And that is the neatest thing. Once I figured out how to use this pound um, formula, I thought, wow, it's, it's actually very, very neat and very interchangeable. Because as long as I know two factors in the bottom of that formula, I could figure out for pounds. And if I know all the factors, if, if I know the, the, the volume, if I know the concentration and 8.34, which is always, that never changes, then I can figure out the final dry pounds. So once again, I'm gonna go through these slides here and then you're gonna see how in this, in this slide, I know 25 pounds per day, but I don't know what my volume was, but I do know what my concentration was in milligrams per liter. And I know that 8.34 is always what a gallon of water weighs. So what did I do? I took 25 and I divided it by 1.5 milligrams per liter and I divided it by 8.34. And then that gave me that two million gallons and then inversely you could do it any other way like right here in this formula right here if i took 25 pounds and i divided it by <clears throat> four million gallons and by 8.34 why don't we do that you're going to get a different answer 25 divided by four million gallons divided by 8.34 is going to give you a 0.8 milligram per liter dosage. So I hope that everybody watching uh, these slides understands how this, this whole formula works. So if I, know, if I know all the factors in the bottom of the formula, which is, is what this pro problem gives me, it gives me the 1.5 right here. <clears throat> it gives me the 2 million gallons. And I always know that a gallon of water is 8.34. When I multiply all those bottom factors together, <clears throat> I get pounds. But when I am missing one of those factors, like I was in this formula, then I divide the final result, which is in pounds per day, I, the 25 by the 2 million gallons by the 8.34, and I get the 1.5. So.
So it's very, uh, it's very interchangeable. But one of, the, one of the things you always have to remember is in this formula, you always have to know three of the factors. So in this case, in this slide, we knew that we dosed 25 pounds in a day. <clears throat> we, know the, we know the volume in 2 million gallons. And we know that a gallon of water was 8.34. So I got three factors. So having those three factors, then I could figure out what the concentration was. If I only have two factors, I, the formula doesn't do anything for me. <clears throat> so let's just say that I had 2 million gallons a day and I had 8.34, but I didn't know how many pounds went in. I can't figure it out. I got to have three either at the bottom or one at the top and two at the bottom factors to be able to figure out this calculation. So I hope that uh, the explanation that we've gone through this so far is as clear as mud and that uh, we can go ahead and, uh, and understand this formula. So <clears throat> that's the end of the uh, calculation review. As you continue to progress in the water treatment field, you're going to notice that uh, a lot of the problems uh, are going to get a little bit more difficult. But as long as you have mastery of that chlorine demand formula, and as long as you have mastery of the pounds formula, there really is no, no problem that you can't figure out. Okay, okay. Ebony, uh, thank you. Does anybody have any questions regarding the math that we just went over? Looks like we have a few here. Um, Bertrand, I'm sorry if I said your name wrong. Uh, do you use the residual uh, concentration or the doses concentration? <clears throat> Do I use a residual? Okay, I'm, can you repeat the question? I'm trying to understand it. I believe he's asking, do you use the residual concentration or the dosage concentration in this equation? Okay, when it comes to the pounds formula, it, whether it's a dose or if it's a residual, it's immaterial. As long as I have, um, when, when, okay, I'll just put it this way. If you're putting clean water into a two million gallon storage tank, if that, if that water if it has no, no, nothing that's going to create a demand in it, then, then it doesn't matter if it's dose or residual because whatever you have in there is what you have. It's, it's you're drawing water out of a tank. So maybe I did dose it at 1.5. And then when I filled up the tank to 2 million gallons and I measured the water again, it was still 1.5. Why? Because there was no demand. It was super clean water. And so that, that's what I'm trying to get at. So. Uh, what this formula is actually doing, it, it, it could either be dose or it could be residual. It, it's, it's interchangeable. It's kind of immaterial. As long as you know what it is inside of your tank, that that's how you calculate how much chlorine you have left in the tank. I hope, I hope that uh, explanation was clear. If not, uh, you can repost the question again and I can re-explain. Perfect. Um then let's move on to the next. What is the common practice in rounding up or down when dealing with dosage? Mindful of the fact that rounding up leads you to dosing more than re the required value and rounding down leads um, to supplying less than you need. <clears throat> yeah. Well, when, when I was in grade school, when they taught me to round out, it basically meant that if I had a, a decimal, let's just say that I had a 1.96. So that six puts me closer to, to a, a two than a 1.94 does. So then what I would do is that if it's a 1.96, I could round it out to two. But if it's a 1.94, then I'm closer to 1.9. So I, I could put 1.9 because it's closer to 1.9. And that's the general rule that, I, that, that most of us are taught when we're in grade school is that the closer the nearest whole number is, is what you round off to. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Looks like we were done with the math questions for now. We would like to go back to the chlorination questions. Sure. Uh, what is the time difference between grabbing the sample and taking measurements? Um, when it comes to chlorine, that's, that's a good question. Um, that's a good one. Thank you for asking that one. When you grab a grab sample is something that you grab in real time, you grab at the moment. Remember that <clears throat> chlorine with time dissipates. That's why generally if you take a grab sample and you send it to a lab and they receive it the next day, that chlorine reading that they're going to get is not going to be the same reading of, uh, 
a residual of when you first grabbed it. Because remember, chlorine disintegrates with time, with temperature. And so <clears throat> a grab sample has to be taken immediately. That residual has to be taken on the spot because that's the most accurate residual reading that you're going to be taking. If you take it, if you take a grab sample, and you put it in the fridge or you put it in your truck or you put it anywhere else and you take it the next day, that is no longer representative of that chlorine residual when you first grab the sample. Um, back on chlorination, is the 0 0.2 residual a requirement in a distribution system or just detectable? That's required. Okay. It is, it is a requirement because it basically lets ADEQ know that uh, that there was that there was a good safe residual in the water and that your total coliform sample is going to pass. Now I do know this, there are times when <clears throat> it could be less than two and you still take your sample at the furthest end of the distribution system and that sample still passes. <clears throat> and then so your sample is acceptable. But generally, it's recommended that you have that 0 0.2 because that that basically lets the regulatory agencies know that you're that you achieved the uh, that your demand was met and there was nothing left in that in that in that water that that would uh, that would harm anyone. But then once again, that's why we all I didn't really touch up on this in the, in the slides. But when you take a coliform sample, that's like a confirmation that when you dose chlorine, you dosed it properly. And it could well be that you have a residual that's even less, but as long as that water has no coliform uh, colonies building up in it, then that, that that was properly disinfected. There are times, in, and I've been working in this industry, that you've had cul-de-sacs, and maybe it's the summer and you have 150 degree heat, and it's a cul-de-sac at the farthest end of your distribution system. <clears throat> and then you take a sample there, and that sample, that coliform sample can pass, but the water has no chlorine in it. And so uh, that's not, you know, it, the water's still safe because you proved it with a coliform sample, <clears throat> but you basically want to see that chlorine residual in there at all times because it's an assurance that the water is safe. It's a visible assurance that the water is possibly disinfected. And sometimes what you have to do is that you have to have a flushing program in your distribution system to make sure that that chlorine residual is detected. And you want to be able to prove to the regulatory agencies that there was a, uh, that there was a chlorine residual at all times <clears throat> because sometimes what can happen is that you could randomly take a sample at the furthest end of your distribution system and it has no chlorine and if you haven't conducted a coliform test you don't know if that water is safe to drink or not so you always it's always recommended that you have that 0 0.2 at least milligram per liter residual in the water because that's a visible immediate confirmation that the water's safe to drink. Perfect. Um, one more additional question. Looks like we have two more. Uh, what is the expected fleet, or free chlorine residual at the contact time? Effluent. What is the expected <laughs> free chlorine residual at the contact time effluent? Okay. So once it achieve, achieves a desired contact time, one of the slides that I've been mentioned of, it says that you got to have at least a 0 0.2. Recommended is 0 0.5 after, after it goes through your chlorine contact basin. <clears throat> now, just as a general term, working many years in the industry, we always try to have a 0 0.5 to a 1.0 chlorine residual in the water to even into your distribution system. If you have a 0 0.2, you're really kind of close. Okay. All right, um, last question. Uh, back on chlorination, what temperature range is acceptable to store chlor um, cal me, calcium hypochlorite? Calcium hypochlorite should be stored <clears throat> between 70 and 85 degrees. And that way it keeps its strength for a lot longer. It, it could keep its strength to those 60 days. <clears throat> Cold weather does not necessarily affect chlorine, but hot weather does. Hot weather degrades chlorine. So the hotter the weather outside, <clears throat> you can expect that it could be in dry form or it could be in liquid form, that your chlorine is going to degrade a lot sooner. 
All right. Apologies, Joe, I found two more questions here. No problem, I'll keep them coming. All right, um, chloramines are used in many mycelopathic, oh, excuse me, ah, excuse me, today I cannot, <laughs> municipalities, uh, what are the benefits of liquid, Alexa, what are the benefits versus liquid chlorine? I see, so chloramine, uh, chloramines versus liquid chlorine for municipalities. <clears throat> Okay, I didn't. I didn't really touch upon chloramines and chlorination because, <clears throat> in general terms, a lot of municipalities will not use chloramines to treat water. And what chloramines are is that you add ammonia to chlorine, and what it does is it makes it more stable. <clears throat> I, I've been. We've been talking about taking uh, distribution system readings. <clears throat> and I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice here. Taking distribution system, reading at the farthest end of the distribution system, and you need a 0 0.2. When you add chloramine or ammonia to the water, when you dose a small dose of ammonia to your water, it makes that residual more stable. So that when you do take it at the far end of the distribution system, you have a better chance of getting that 0 0.2, especially if it's hot weather. But it's got some drawbacks because if you, you know, if you don't dose your ammonia correctly, ammonia smells really bad. And it's gonna it's gonna really um, emphasize the chlorine smell in the water, and so you have to be very careful with chloramines. Sometimes <clears throat> you could even have chloramines without um, putting chlor uh, ammonia in the water. But sometimes, yeah, I always use this example in some of my classes. Like when you go to a pool, like a public uh, water pool, you know, the, the public pool. You get there, and a lot of people say, "Oh man, there's a mean chlorine smell here." And what that basically means, it doesn't mean that there's a lot of chlorine in the water necessarily. It means that uh, that there have been kids in the water who have peed in that pool and, and urine has ammonia. And they create that smell, that high chlorine smell that, that, that you detect. And so that that's what a chloramine is. It's, it's a binding of chlorine with ammonia. And if you're binding chlorine with the ammonia, you really don't have a free chlorine residual in the water because free chlorine is a point where everything has been oxidized or destroyed. You have no more ammonia. So in all reality, if you go to a pool and that pool shows a chlorine residual, but there's no very predominant, very high chlorine smell, it means that that, that pool water has been fully oxidized by the chlorine so that there's no smell at all. And that's what you really want. But when you get to a pool and you smell that smell, I mean, sometimes it, it basically means that Whoever's taking care of that pool, hey, you need to up your chlorine dose because you got ammonia in it, and that's where we're getting that smell. And you got to eliminate it that way. Okay. Well, last one on chlorination. What are the precautions to take when handling chlorine, uh, chlorine compounds, and water treatment? Well, remember that <clears throat> chlorine. Uh, it's very interesting. When you're dealing with chlorine glass, it's very obvious. Chlorine gas can kill you. That's why they used it in World War II. Uh, the, Nazi, uh, <clears throat> the Nazi government or Hitler, he, he used chlorine gas against soldiers during World War II because it's very deadly. When, the minute it enters into your lungs, it, it basically becomes acidic in your lungs and it fries them. That's why it's very harsh to the respiratory system. A lot of munis today aren't using chlorine gas for that purpose. When you deal with chlorine gas, it's always good to have some type of SCBA, which means self-contained breathing apparatus when you're working around it because it's very harmful and toxic to your lungs. Now, when you're dealing with, <clears throat> with tablets, it's kind of the same thing. Tablets will off-gas, and it's because they're 60%, they're going to they're gonna off-gas a higher percentage of that gas. And then also when you're handling them, <clears throat> because whenever chlorine comes in contact with water, Remember that it becomes hypochlorous acid, <clears throat> which is the highest form or the strongest form of free chlorine. That acid will actually burn your hands if you're handling it. So you have to be very careful with handling chlorine. Sometimes people say, hey, you know what? When I touch chlorine, <clears throat> the hypochlorite, uh, I notice that it feels very slippery in my hands. And it's not that chlorine in itself is very slippery. It's that it's slowly dissolving uh, the layers of your skin, and that's why it's slippery. So touching chlorine, uh, breathing chlorine is never a good thing. Always use gloves, always use uh, safety glasses. And if you're dealing with a gas, make sure you're dealing in a well-ventilated area and that you have self-contained breathing apparatus. 
Thank you. So we've got a question back on um, chemical dosing math. Um, are these methods and types of uh, analysis defined by the operating permit? Okay, one more time, Emily, please. Are these methods and types of analysis defined by the operating permit? Um, Brian, are you mean like the treatment permit? Um, they're not. They're not going to be outlined in any permit, whether water or wastewater. They're just tools that that are used by the industry, by the field, to help operators determine uh, dosages. So, like the pounds formula will not appear on any point any permit uh, be it a water treatment plant permit or a wastewater treatment plant permit neither will the uh the chlorine dose and demand formula they're just tools that the operator uses to be able to do his job correctly perfect it looks like that's the wrap of our our questions so far joe that um, is very awesome <laughs> i really do appreciate the questions that uh, that lets me understand that uh many of the attendees were very uh were very awake during the presentation once again, I had a lot of fun doing this, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be uh, to be with all of you this morning uh, with this information. Like I said, I think that it has benefited me, and hopefully, it has benefited you uh, just as much. Thank you very much. I had a lot of fun. Thank you again, Joe. Um, we're about four minutes to ten. Excuse me, now three minutes to ten. So we'll go ahead and start break a little bit early. We will be back in session at 10, 10 a.m. with DBPs in Arizona, um, presented by Namho and Sergio Mejo. Mejo, excuse me. We'll see you back then.
Alright everyone, we're going to resume our session for the day. It's now 10, 10 a.m. Sergio Nam, are you too prepared for your section of the presentation or the webinar? Yes, we are. Perfect. Um, should I transfer the screen over to you, Sergio? Or no? Uh, you could transfer it over to me, please. All right, thank you. Can you see my screen? It looks good. Please proceed. Thank All you. All right. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So today, um, we will be covering disinfection byproducts and control slash treatment methods. My name is Sergio Mejia, and I'm an environmental engineer specialist one here with ADEQ. And then we also have Nam Ho, our environmental associate engineer. Okay, so today's agenda includes our main topic of concern, uh, disinfection byproducts or DBPs. Uh, so we'll delve into the, uh, different, uh, the definition, formation, uh, precursors, and, and look at a few DBP or formation plots to observe some trends. Uh, my colleague Nam Ho will present on management strategies to reduce DBP formation, and we'll also look at some treatment options. So let's begin with uh, disinfection byproducts. So what are DBPs? So DBPs are produced by the reaction of free chlorine with natural organic matter, uh, NOM for short, uh, found in our source waters. So DBPs can be found in the air during activities such as showering, bathing, uh, dishwashing, uh, swimming, and people are also exposed to DBPs by drinking chlorinated or brominated water which we'll learn more. And one thing to note is that NOM can be approximated by the total um, amount of uh, total organic carbon, TOC, uh, present in the uh, source water. So we'll go more into detail later. And then as for water chemistry, when natural organic uh, matter combines with chlorine, it leads to DBP formation such as THMs, haloacetic acids, and other compounds. So some of the regulated DBPs under the Safe Drinking Water Act are trihalomethanes, THMs, as we know, haloacetic acids, HAA5, uh, chloride, and bromate. So these regulated DBPs can be found out in our distribution system, um, in the treatment plant, during disinfection. Uh, storage reservoirs are usually locations where we can find find these DBPs. And then um, as mentioned earlier, we will talk about uh, management strategies and treatment options to reduce DBPs in our public water systems. But first, let's review the maximum contaminant levels for the major DBPs we are covering today. So first we have THMs with an MCL of 0 0.08 milligrams per liter and HAA5 with an MCL of 0 0.06 milligrams per liter. So THMs and HAA5 are primarily found in the distribution system where water remains stagnant for long period, periods of time or reacts with other natural organic matter. Uh, so for chloride, it has an MCL of one milligram per liter and is usually found when public water systems use chlorine dioxide for disinfection. So monitoring for chlor uh, chloride occurs daily at the entry point to distribution system or the EPDS for short and uh, monthly in the distribution system. Uh, for bromate it has an MCL of 0 0.01 milligrams per liter and is usually found when public water systems use ozone for disinfection. Bromate is monitored uh, monthly at the EPDS. So it's also important to note that MCOs are the common uh, DBPs we find in our public water systems to help us get a better understanding of what and how the disinfectants can 
impact the water in our systems. So now let's go over what are precursors. So as we know, uh, DBPs are general, generally formed by the reaction of disinfectants, such as chlorine, with organic precursors present in uh, source water. So as we know, our natural organic matter. So these organic precursors are usually found in surface uh, water sources or groundwater under the influence of surface water, GUTI. Um, and then humic and fulvic acids are byproducts of the biological decay and breakdown in the presence of chlorine and are normally present in soluble form. So when precursors are present from source water and react with disinfectants, it will lead to DBP formation. So it is important to reduce the organic precursors before disinfection of water in the distribution system. So we now understand that organic precursors can form from decaying vegetation, organisms, and anthropogenic uh, discharges. So organic precursors are measured as uh, surrogate parameters, uh, such as total organic carbon, VOC, dissolved uh, organic, DOC, ultraviolet absorbance, UV, and specific ultraviolet absorbance. So in practice, we usually see that the higher the level for these parameters, the greater of a chance of DBP formation. And another thing to note is that aromatic fractions form higher DBPs than non-aromatic fractions. And as a reminder, uh, the common disinfectants used by public water systems are chlorine as chlorine gas, sodium hypochlorite as a liquid, and co uh, calcium hypochlorite as in tablet form. So also uh, these, um, there, there, is our, there are chloramines, which are most uh, commonly uh, formed when ammonia is added to chlorine. So our source water supplies play a significant role in reducing or increasing the precursors and DBP formation. So as for groundwater, it is typically free of organics and will not contribute to, uh, will not contribute precursors to the DBP formation process. So on the other hand, uh, surface water or groundwater under the influence of surface water uh, will have precursors and will contribute to DBP formation. So it's also important to monitor uh, total organic carbon, the TOC levels in water, because TOC levels above uh, typically two milligrams per liter will lead to DBP formation. And as we have learned, uh, the formation of DBPs depend on a variety of factors, such as the concentration and characteristics of precursors, the disinfectant type and dose, time, pH, temperature, bromide, nitrogen, bioactivity, and what materials may be used in the distribution system. So as per disinfectant type and dose, chlorine forms the highest amount of halogenated DBPs and is one of the main reactants. So some DBPs act as an intermediate product to form other DBPs as end products when there's an excess of chlorine. So for example, some haloacetic acids that are formed with chlorine can produce THMs with an excess of the disinfectant used at the plant. So in general, the higher the dose, the greater formation of DBPs. DBP formation with time depends on the precursors and disinfectant that are present. If the DBP is the end product, then increasing the reaction time will result in an increase of DBPs in the system. For haloacetic acids, it may biodegrade with time at lower disinfectant residuals. However, as the water ages in the distribution system and stays stagnant, the more time is allowed for DBP formation. Now for temperature, most systems experience DBP formation during warmer months of the year. So it is typical to see a higher formation of DBPs during the summer and fall seasons and lower formation during winter and spring seasons. 
And of course, there are factors that may offset temperature's effect on DBP formation. So some of those examples include a higher demand during the summer month can reduce the time of stagnant water in the distribution system, um, or precursor levels and characteristics may change seasonally. And also uh, higher temperatures may increase bio biodegradation of precursors in the treatment process and increase biodegradation of haloacetic acids in the distribution system. So finally, uh, we can look at water chemistry in relation to DBP formation. So for pH, when the pH of water increases, THMs will increase and HAs5 uh, will for, formation will decrease. Uh, when bromide levels are high, there's a greater chance of brominated DBP species. So we'll go over some uh, examples of DBP formation in relation to the different factors we have discussed. So now we'll go over an example of how different water quality parameters affect DBP formation. The parameters listed are for us to replicate uh, what baseline conditions may be present at a public water system. So for DBP formation with time, uh, we can see that TTHM and HAA5 formation is the highest during the initial uh, one or two hours. Uh, but it gradually flattens over time. And then we can also see that for TTHM, um, as time increases, we can see that it exceeds the MCL between 48 and 72 hours. So when we look at DBP formation with temperature, higher temperatures will always result in higher TTH formation. So there is a significant increase in DBP formation when going from uh, 5 degrees Celsius to 25 degrees Celsius with increasing time, as we can see on the x-axis. So um, we can also see that trend with haloacidic acids, but it's not as significant compared to TTHM. So DBP formation um, for a chlorine dose we can see a general increase with TTHM and HAA5 as the DOC ratios and chlorine dose increase. So it's safe to assume that the loss of residual may have contributed to the gradual flattening of both curves. And now looking at precursor levels, both TTHM and HAA5 increase as TOC levels increase. As we can see on the x-axis goes from zero to five milligrams per liter. So for example, if we look at TTH formation at four milligrams per liter TOC, it is about, uh, we could say about three times um, the TTH formation at one milligrams per liter TOC. Now, um, looking at pH with uh, DBP formation, uh, the higher the pH results in, in higher TTH formation, and that is the opposite for uh, haloacetic acids with the lower um, HAA5 formation. So we can see on the graph that the, the pH is around 8.45 that the DBPs for HAA5 are formed around 40 micrograms per liter and for TTHM around the MCL. So uh, DBP formation with uh, bromide, the TTHM concentrations increase with an increase in bromide concentration. Uh, so the op this, uh, it is opposite for HAA5 when concentrations decrease with the increase in bromide. So this could uh, be a result of other brominated haloacetic acids that are formed.
So in summary, uh, we saw that the increase in time, temperature, TOC, and chlorine dose increased the formation of DBPs. An increase in pH increases uh, TTHM formation, and HAA5 decreases, and the same pattern goes for when bromide increases. So it is also important to note that TOC, pH, and bromide can be best managed at the treatment plant to uh, control DBP formation. And then chlorine dose um, usually, well, chlorine dose uh, is usually managed best at the treatment plant as well, and also in the distribution system. And then water age, uh, usually that's best controlled in the distribution system. So it's really important, um, which Nam will talk on more, about looping the distribution system and looking into flushing. So I will hand over the presentation to Nam, who will talk about the management strategies to reduce DBP formation. Good morning, everyone. Morning, everyone. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Is there an echo? No? Okay, we're good. So let me share my screen. Give me one second. All right, so we are a little ahead, uh, ahead of schedule, so uh, we'll take this time to ask any questions on Sergio's part about um, DBPs and how it's formed and what parameters may affect it. So do we have any questions at this time? Right now, no. no. Okay. So like I said, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, so we're gonna have a lot of time for some questions at the end, and we'll also have a, a little video that I wanted to show too. So I will be covering um, management strategy to reduce DVP formation. <clears throat> um, so the way I kind of do the presentation is um, I, I like to kind of just talk about what's on the slide, not necessarily go over each point. Um, so uh, the slides are more for your information and may cover more or less information than what I'm talking about. Um, so if you have any questions on what's on the slide, feel free to ask it at the end as well or anything that um, I am presenting on. So, Okay, so um, as Sergio mentioned, uh, disinfection byproducts uh, normally um, are uh, created because there's natural organic matter, uh, you know, bacteria in the water. Uh, specifically, usually in surface water. So it, it is important to manage your, your, your source, right? So if we're talking about surface water, some um, managing your, your raw water source is very important and could affect your uh, disinfection byproducts formation. So um, examples of how to manage your source is to manage your, <coughs> um, the, your intake. So your intake, um, uh, the water quality may change at your intake depending on the season or the water depth. Um, as as you all know in Arizona, you know um, we have seen lakes and reservoirs <coughs> um, levels uh, increase and decrease rapidly. Um, so if your intake is is at a static level and the lake go, is drawn down, you know you may have more organic uh, matter going into your intake which will affect your treatment. <clears throat> um, same with rivers. Um, we see we have some water systems that, you know, they're experiencing low levels and their intake may not um, be fully in the water and just on the shore. So the, you know, the river flows faster in the middle and then it's a little bit more static on the side. So it's a higher chance for organic matter to um, accumulate and then can be um, taken into your, your intake. So. Like I said, the intake is very important. I've seen some water systems with blowers on their intake to kind of uh, blow off some of the algae growing nearby. 
Um, we have floating intakes that will go up and down depending on the uh, water level in the lakes. <coughs> uh, <coughs> other factors, excuse me, other factors that affects your water source also be uh, <coughs> precipitation events. Um, <coughs> We have large um, organic intake during snow melt and after a, a, a rainstorm. Um, <clears throat> you know, some a lot of that storm water is is getting into the the surface water, and you can have a high turbidity, which is a, also an indicator of organic matter um, into. So um, the water system needs to be ready to adjust for that. Some water systems, you know, they have enough storage where they can turn it off to um, to kind of run off with their storage until the um, plume has, has passed, the muddy water um, has passed. So keep an eye on that and um, try to adjust as needed. Um, so again, unfortunately, some water systems don't have the capability to adjust and, you know, have to pump <coughs> year round. So there are other ways to to manage your source there. So <clears throat> blending a source is is another method. Um, some systems have both groundwater and surface water. Um, so I've seen some systems pump wells to their raw water to blend with their uh, surface water to lower their um, total organic carbon, um, another indicator of <coughs> uh, natural organic matter. Um, down so they can, you know, better treat for the water. So many things you can do, um, all kind of like this is proactive, right? So you have to anticipate this because um, when, as I'll talk about later, as uh, DVPs are, and, and uh, Aaron will talk about as well, DVPs are sampled in the distribution system. And um, once you get a level above the maximum contaminant level, it, uh, and it takes a while for it to uh, go back down after you install the a countermeasure. So these are all proactive measures that we wanna take before we even get to a high level to uh, not give um, uh, DVPs a chance to um, get created in, in the system. Okay, so continuing with the uh, source water management, uh, <clears throat> uh, as we mentioned, the water quality is very important and it does change, especially in a surface water source uh, throughout the year. Um, so because the water quality uh, is changing, we also have to change the way we treat the water, right? So traditional surface water um, plant has uh, uh, multiple technologies to help um, treat the water. Um, so you're, you're introducing some chemicals such as coagulation, uh, disinfection, um, pH uh, adjustments. So all these need to be adjusted depending on your water quality, right? So if you're getting high turbidity, we may want to increase coagulation to drop out a lot of those um, dissolved organics. Um, you know, um, your flow, your flow is very, very important, especially if you need a certain uh, loading rate uh, for your uh, filters to be effective. Uh, backwashing, so higher turbidity means you most likely need to backwash more often, um, so your your uh, filters will stay efficient. And then, um, and then disinfection. We'll talk about that a lot more, but you know the amount you're dosing chlorine will be also important um, in your formation of DVPs. Okay, so moving on, uh, we're going to skip around here, but we're going to skip to the distribution system management. Um, water age is a very important um, topic when we're talking about uh, managing DVPs in the distribution system. So um, this is a, a common issues we see with, uh, especially now with the kind of fast pace growing in Arizona. Um, water systems and developers, they want to put in a water system that can handle the, the inflow of all these new homes and everything. So we're putting in 18 inch, 24 inch, 30 inch water lines. Um, so if you can imagine these, you know, a 30 inch line that stretches five miles long, that's a lot of water storage, millions of gallons of water in the system with homes that are not filled yet. So uh, water age management is very important. We want to develop our water system to be able to handle our current population and usage. 
and uh, then build out for the future as well. But we don't want to overbuild, right? Or if we overbuild, if we can, um, you know, um, build it and not put it into operation until we have the demand necessary. So um, as an engineer here at ADQ, we do review plans for distribution system and we do check the demand and full build out and to see if, you know, the, the water is actually flowing through the system. Um, so we don't have these issues. So again, an um, well, another thing to help manage water age in the distribution system is looping the system, um, reducing pipe size, and also having uh, blow offs on your system, reducing dead ends. Um, so again, with some of the older systems that were in place a long time ago, they could have been built with a lot of dead ends. So those can be exercised with um, um, flushing in order to manage DVP formation. Uh, looping your system also is very helpful. The water is always moving. So there's not a place for the um, kind of old water to, to sit. Um, this is common with uh, fire hydrants, right? We have these all these kind of tree branches off of the distribution system that the only uh, you know outlet there is a fire hydrant, and it, it never gets used because the fire you know ne doesn't occur too often. So these are all opportunities for disinfection byproducts to develop. Um, so if you we if you have some of those um, set up, we we ask you to we recommend you to come up with the uh, flushing program in order to exercise those um, hydrants to make sure that we're flushing out that water. So not only that you'll have uh, disinfection byproduct issues in these lines, you'll also have your chlorine will get used up because it's you know forms disinfection byproducts, and then your water is no longer safe because uh, your chlorine residual is zero as is at zero. And so if you do have a bacteria contamination. Um, it's just no longer protected. Um, let's see. So we will talk about storage tank next, I believe. Let's see. Yeah, in the next couple slides. Um, so next, we'll, we'll dive a little bit into how to manage your disinfection system. So um, the the simple way, right, for a water system is to to disinfect. The, the water, especially a uh, surface water system, is required to provide disinfection for, for the water. So surface water systems, you need to have a certain amount of contact time to uh, disinfect your water to remove or log of viruses, right? Is that's the requirement. So depending on how advanced your treatment is, uh, will determine how much you'll have to uh, disinfect. So if you're if you have a simple system, just a filter, you'll get partial credit for um, removal of viruses in your uh, filter, and then the rest is going to be an inactivation of viruses by disinfection. So if you if you're required to disinfect and remove three log with chlorine, you're going to have to dose at a higher amount and have a higher contact time in order to pr provide that um, disinfection. Now, if you have something like, um, you know, advanced uh, filtration, such as RO, um, uh, ultra filtration, you'll have, you'll get more credit for virus removal. And now your disinfection um, requirement with chlorine is a lot less, one to two logs. So you, you, your contact time now decreases. You can design your wet well and your storage a little bit different. And all this, you know, helps with disinfection byproducts. <clears throat> um, so here we're talking about boosting the disinfection within the distribution system. So water systems come in all shapes and sizes, right? Um, so for a, a small system, it may make sense to introduce chlorine once before storage and use the storage tank as contact time before distributing the water. For a larger system, we want to um, you know, not introduce all the chlorine all at once, right? So if it if you're in a large system and it and you have to dose chlorine over the maximum contaminant level of four, you know that that's not a good start to get a to get a residual at you know ten miles down the road, right? So we want to introduce chlorine to provide the residual we like, 
and then boost the uh, chlorine concentration within the distribution system, whether it's after storage or at the, at the booster pumps in order to maintain that residual but not introduce it all at once where um, all that chlorine has a chance to react with the, the water uh, in the distribution system where it's stagnant either, either at dead ends or in the storage tank. So uh, managing your how you disinfect, um, you can achieve the same chlorine, free chlorine residual in your distribution system, but disinfect um, differently by doing partial disinfection and then continuing to boost the, the dosage within the distribution system. Um, for systems that are, uh, you know, that are surface water, you know, you may not want to, you know, you may want to only introduce chlorine to meet your minimum contact time, and then you can also then you can dose it again after storage. Because you can imagine you're treating and uh, you're treating a lot of water, hundreds of thousands of wa uh, gallons of water, and it sits in the storage tanks for many days before it gets distributed. Um, so it's a common issue, especially systems that have large storage for fire um, protection. Uh, we may not get, uh, get to use all that water, um, and then when you have a large event, uh, fire event, all the, the water in the tank gets snoozed up, and now you're introducing DVPs in, into the distribution system. Okay, next we'll talk about storage tank. In my opinion, and from my experience, this is where uh, I see disinfection byproducts form um, the most. Uh, you'll have more formation, obviously, in the distribution system, but um, this is where it starts. So, um, a good good question to ask yourselves as we keep emphasizing what what is the water age, right? So, um, so we we can we calculate our minimum storage requirement based on the average daily use uh, um, at that water system. And then uh, plus fire flow. That's so. That's the minimum. Obviously, a lot of uh, water systems will like to have more than just one day of water storage, so they'll have three, four days in case the system goes down. So, what is what is the water age? But that doesn't mean that you can't um, that you can have different water age. So, you have large storage. Your water age could be faster uh, depending on how you exercise your your storage tank, which we'll go in in a second. Um, so it's important to know your, your minimum storage requirement, right, and design around that and then have a safety factor on that. But then also you want to know what your demand is in your system and how much your system can produce and then find a, find a good balance on that. So you'll have your, you know, your daily average demand, you'll have your max demands for showers uh, in the morning and evenings when the water gets drawn uh, quickly. So you want to figure out how you ha want your storage tank to operate. Um, uh, some storage tanks have float valve, some, some, some are on SCADA. So um, a lot of systems, they like to top off their storage tank, right? Like the float goes down one feet and the pump kicks on to fill it up. So um, this can produce uh, stratification in the tank, especially in the summer months, you'll have warm water on top and cold water on the bottom. Um, a lot of parameters can affect uh, formation of DVPs in this case. How is your intake uh, set up in your storage tank? Is it the intake the same as the outlet? Some storage tanks that are floating on the distribution systems are set up this way. Um, you know, a good practice is having the intake uh, on the opposite side of the outlet and uh, introducing water at the top of the storage tank instead of at the bottom, All right? Um, mixers are a very uh, are also recommended. It's not very common because there's not too much regulation around um, you know water quality in the storage tank. So you know if your system is running normal, you have your EPDS, your uh, sampling point after the storage tank. You know nine times out of ten, you're going to get a good sample out of there during normal operation. But again, as my example before, you'll get a large draw. Uh, of water because of a fire or a large event and this is when that old water that's been sitting in the storage tank for months is now introduced into the the system so introducing a mixer kind of resolves this it it, it, it you kind of assume that you have a uh, uh, equal 
uh, you know, water quality in the storage tank at all times. You can be more confident that your sampling result is actually a representation of your water quality in your system. Um, so some of these larger systems, uh, even smaller systems, we can put in uh, mixers to help aid with uh, formation of, of DVPs. And we'll go into a little bit more in depth into some uh, some mixers we have out there now to, to actually focus on DVP um, treatment. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, decreasing water age will help with disinfection byproducts, right? So remember, you have water age in the storage tank and also in the uh, dis uh, distribution. So um, some experiments or um, testing I've done myself is, you know, we want to, when we go out to these systems that have DVP exceedances, that's where we check first. We check at the storage tank to see if there are already DVP formation. So if it's already formed in the storage tank, then you know that there is a water quality issue, a chlorine demand that is, is causing this. If it's not formed in the storage tank, that means you, you have you probably have good water age in your storage tank. And then but your distribution system may be the issue. So um, it gives you kind of an idea of where to start. Um, on, on treatment and prevent, um, you know, and also preventing DVPs instead of kind of a, a shot in the dark. So, for example, if I had DVPs in the distribution system but I'm not at the storage tank, installing an aerator in my storage tank may not be as effective because the, your issue is your water age in the distribution. So, again, lots of factor. This this contaminant is not an easy one to 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 deal with. And when we're, you know, kind of when it occurs in our system, it takes a long time to um, kind of in, uh, install the correct countermeasure in order to reduce the, the level of DVPs. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit already. Uh, flushing dead ends, um, again, uh, depending on how your system is, is set up, um, dead ends, uh, especially in the warmer months, your chlorine residual can get used up at these points so it's common practice to do some non-compliance testing field testing in these areas to see to see what your um, chlorine residual is so a good indicator of DVP formation is low chlorine um, pre-chlorine residual um, <clears throat> uh, we try to set up our your sampling plan with ADQ to for your hot spots for DVPs in your distribution so most most of these spots are going to be at dead ends or at the far end of the system. So, but you know we can only cover so much. We, we're, we're asking to uh, not too many samples, and if a system has many dead ends, you know your systems could be your your samples could not be representing your water quality. So, um, you know it's on the system to ensure that these areas are protected. Um, if the dead ends have service connection on, on them, you know this. Even though they're dead ends, you're you're getting demand in these areas, so you're, you're the water is getting used up a little bit. So your flushing may not need to be aggressive. But if you have dead ends with no usage in that area because of a hydrant or just fire protection, then uh, we want to definitely be aware of these areas. So. Um, Water systems that have developers coming in or commercial areas that want to use the potable system for fire protection, you know, we want you to uh, loop the system if possible, or you know, ask them to install a, a back. A backflow flow device, right? So the water is there for fire protection only. If you put a device on a dead end uh, branch system, that water you can guarantee that water will never travel back towards uh, into the distribution system. Again, the water in the dead end most likely it's going to sit there, but if you have a large draw downstream from it, it's going to pull from that dead end, and all that water again will get introduced to the the system. So, um, but if you put a backflow preventer there, that water will be there until you need to use it for fire protection. But if you have a large draw downstream, that is now protected because of your backflow device. So again, a lot to consider. Um, you know, 
I um, take what I say with a grain of salt. You know, there's there's pros and cons with everything. You know, for example, backflow device, right? Maybe it's not possible to introduce it because it's going to reduce your pressure and flow significantly. And you need, if you need 2,000 gallons per minute for the, you know, fire requirement, that may not be an option. But there are the solution, like I mentioned, um, looping the the fire the fire line around the building instead of having two on the either end for fire protection may be an option. <clears throat> okay. All right, give me a second here. Okay. And um, so this morning you guys had a presentation on how to some uh, how to calculate chlorine dosage or the sum of the math. Um, which was a great presentation. So it ties in with disinfection byproducts for sure. Um, <clears throat> so how are you measuring your chlorine residual, right? The requirement uh, for with uh, ADQ and uh, the Drink Safe Drinking Water Act is uh, systems that, uh, community systems and uh, non-community systems that are using chlorine um, for disinfection uh, is required to monitor for chlorine, pre-chlorine residual at the RTCR location, the location you're testing your back T as well in your system um, and report that. Um, with, with ADQ, it's, uh, um, it's called Myrtles, right? And you report your uh, free chlorine residual each uh, month along with your uh, back T result. Um, but there is no requirement for, for total chlorine, which is also a good um, indicator to, to test for, for uh, chlorine, um, especially to see if your chlorine is getting used up in the system by, um, by something. So whether that's a bacteria uh, contamination or high uh, natural organic matter, uh, measuring your chlorine versus your free chlorine, total chlorine versus your free chlorine could give you a good indicator of, you know, um, the, if the chlorine is being used up. So, for example, if you're dosing at two uh, parts per million and you're only getting a 0.3 uh, residual sh in a short amount of time or uh, distance, then there could be something in your system that's heating up. So, if you're measuring free chlorine all the time, you're not really noticing it this and you're just dosing at a higher and higher chlorine to get the residual you want. So um, it's not the best total chlorine because it doesn't, it's not like a one for one. In my experience using the field test kit, if I'm dosing at two parts per million upstream and I measure downstream, ideally I should get two. But um, that's not always the case since, you know, the we're limited to our um, technology and how, how well the, the field test kit works. But um, to kind of counter that, right, to go into the next uh, topic, you know, what are you dosing your system at? So again, with this surface water system, is it, you know, you, you probably know what you're dosing at because you are trying to achieve um, four log inactivation as well as contact time. So you're required to know how much you're dosing in order to um, have a certain amount of contact time and then produce a certain residual before the water even enters the distribution system. So for groundwater, uh, remember uh, disinfection is an option. You're not required to disinfect your water because it's coming out of the ground unless you have an uh, issue uh, with uh, bacteria contamination such as uh, E. coli at your um, source in your well. Even if you have total coliform in your well, um, you're not required to, to disinfect. It, it will help you alleviate that issue, but you won't have a certain residual you have to produce to um, as far as the regulation. So again, kind of going um, um, off topic here, but if you do have uh, E. coli uh, exceedances or uh, positives at your well, you know, you may be required to do four log inactivation just as a, a anyway, I digress. So the uh, chlorine residual is very important for you to know how much you're dosing because this allows you to calculate what your chlorine demand is. 
So again, if you're dosing at a certain level and your free chlorine is, you're going to expect a, a, a lower level of your free chlorine. However, but if you're getting the same residual, but you have to increase your dose, that means something is eating up your chlorine. Again, and those are all the things we've talked about today, right? It could be your water quality, introducing more organic matter, depending on the season. It could be a dead bird in your storage tank. It could be uh, a leak in your distribution system. And now you have uh, bacteria introduced into your system. Again, your disinfection is in your system in order to protect from this, but also, you know, it it only does so much and then it, it it's the water system's responsibility to to know that these systems i mean uh, that these issues are occurring and be aware so if you're you're you know you're used to dosing two parts per million and now you notice you're dosing four parts per million and you're getting the same residual you know we we want to track down where that demand is and and repair it, whether that's, um, you know, something in your storage tank, maybe it's time to clean out your storage tank, you have, you know, high sediment built, you know, it's warm, algae's growing, etc. cetera. So. <clears throat> okay, so we're gonna jump into alternative disinfection uh, treatment. Um, so what I've been talking about mostly today so far is just chlorine, sodium hypochloride, liquid, tablets, you name it. So there are other methods of uh, disinfection that is also as equally as effective, if not better. Um, so these are a couple that uh, I'll be going over: chlorine dioxide, UV disinfection, ozone, and chloramines. These are all um, alternatives to chlorine to disinfect your water. So I'll be going over kind of the pros and cons about about these um, these um, alternative methods. So chlorine dioxide is a very uh, strong oxidant and disinfectant. Um, it, it reduces DVP formation because you're no longer uh, introducing pure chlorine to interact with, um, excuse me, in interact with any of the organic matter TOC in your water. Instead, your disinfectant now is chlorine dioxide. So. Um, this chemical doesn't react with bromine, so if your ground, um, as I experienced, I've seen a groundwater system um, have bromine. Bromine is, when reacted with chlorine, can form a uh, disinfection byproducts all um, under uh, TTHM, so uh, bromoform is a type of disinfection byproducts. So if you do have that in your groundwater um, naturally, you know you may consider chlorine dioxide. In use. Again, um, as also a note, a lot of these alternative, it's a little takes a little bit more work. It's uh, it's not as easy as chlorine. Um, you know, it's it's it can be more effective, but also be uh, more hazardous. So, you know, like I said, take it with a grain of salt. We need to analyze if you're going to go with the alternative uh, disinfection. We need to make sure it fits that system. Um, so another advantage of chlorine dioxide is it is uh, doesn't uh, has no impact on pH. However, some of the disadvantage is um, chlorine dioxide um, doesn't leave a residual, right? So it is very good at disinfecting the water at the headworks after treatment after filtration. However, the residual you get is, you know, you can't just measure free chlorine because that's not your content, um, your chemical anymore. You have now you have to measure chlorine dioxide, um, and it's a very um, kind of difficult way to, to to measure, right? So some systems that that do have it, whether they're using it for disinfection or some other for oxidation, um, you can see that um, the if you ever been in a training for how to sample for chlorine dioxide you only have about a 15 minute window to do the field test so um, a lot of systems they got a sample run it back to their lab and conduct the the, the bench uh, top test and if your sampling point is 15 minutes away from your lab you know now we have an issue so we got to either do it in the field change your sampling point or you know not use this type of uh, disinfectant um, so, like I said, the whole time is short for the field testing. It requires um, 
it may require a high grade operator to run the system. It does fall. To, if you do have this type of disinfectant, you're, you're we graded at some sort of treatment grade for the system if you don't have it already. So for example, if you're a groundwater system graded at distribution one, you know, chlorine dioxide will give you a treatment grade as well. So it will require um, a higher trained operator in both distribution and treatment grades. Okay, UV disinfection. Uh, many of you are familiar with this. Uh, you'll you'll see it in um, <clears throat> many uh, many systems. So you're using UV um, light to inactivate protozoas, uh, bacteria, you name it. Again, so very effective, um, very fast, and you know you can take cheap as up to you you know you're, you're going to pay for the cost of electricity of running this but right it could be a, a one-time install you're not going to have um, the cost of chlorine um, continuously right and then you'll pay for the operation maintenance of the, the uv light so um, disadvantage you'll have no uh, residual again so for a groundwater system, maybe the, uh, or, you know, for, a, let's say you have a water system that is for a school, you know, maybe this will be, this will work because your distribution system is small. You have very little chance of contamination in your system. You don't have that many, that many linear feet of water line. You want to disinfect the water as it comes out of the ground and then it gets used up pretty quickly. So UV may be a better choice than, than chlorine. However, but for a surface water treatment plant, you know, you can use UV to meet your um, four log inactivation of viruses, and then use chlorine as a, uh, to provide residual to pr further protect the system. So now you're introducing chlorine at a very, at a, a lower dosage, because you're not required to do the contact time because you've taken care of it with UV. And now you're you're kind of treating it like a groundwater system where you're just providing the uh, residual in case there was ever a, a, a contamination. Uh, the chlorine will protect the the water system or the the user from any uh, bacteria contamination. And um, so now your chlorine dosage is lower. Your demand chlorine demand is lower, and you um, have less chance for uh, DVP for me. <coughs> um let's see again the equipment is only as new as good as how the users use it so um, some of these uh, require cleaning um, some have automatic cleaners uh, um, affect the efficiency of the uv light so the equipment can foul um, depending uh, you know so it depends on how you set it up if you have multiple trains where one one size can can be down and you can continue to disinfect as you clean the other side or do you just have one unit and then once it's down, your, your system's down. So um, again, the, the UV light can be hazardous if not handled correctly. So uh, we want to you know follow the operations manual if we're going to introduce UV light <coughs> into the system. All right. Okay, give me one second. <coughs> okay, ozone. Ozone is another very uh, strong disinfectant. We don't see it very often. Um, I've never seen it used as purely as a disinfectant uh, by itself. It's normally used for advanced oxidation uh, to help with uh, treatment of other contaminant. Um, for example, in Tucson, they used to use ozone uh, to treat for, as part of their treatment for uh, TCE, right? Um, so, like I said, it's a very strong oxidant. So, this one we don't recommend to to do, but it, it is a side effect as as it also will disinfect the the water as well. So, um, it basically destroys the organics in the the water, and then um, so in that sense, it's very effective. Um, but you know, it could uh, you know create um, you know it could be too strong. Uh, like I said, it oxidizes the water, so this could change the pH. It could uh, affect your uh, corrosion in, in the system. So um, <clears throat> if we're introducing this type of disinfectant or oxidi uh, oxidizing agent, then we need to definitely probably do a, a pilot test and uh, 
you know, make sure we're not affecting <clears throat> any of the other um, water quality, right? So as we look at uh, all these alternative, right? This is where we're, today we're mainly talking about disinfecting the water and how not to form DPP formations. But as we change what we introduce to the water, it affects all the other parameters around around it as well, as, as you'll see with some of the treatment examples that we'll be providing. So keep that in mind as well. So can be uh, difficult, not gonna be a one-stop shop. And if we change over to this disinfectant, it's gonna fix all our problems. So we may fix the disinfection byproduct issue, but we may create a new issue. So <clears throat> we gotta consider um, all the uh, contam or all the water parameters as we introduce uh, new chemicals and methods into how we treat our water. Okay, uh, I won't go over this too much, but uh, there are, um, you know, there are the disadvantage listed there for ozone. <clears throat> okay, so the last uh, alternative that I want to talk about is chloramines. Chloramines is <clears throat> um, another type of disinfectant. You're actually using chlorine to create a different type of disinfectant. Uh, so as Sergio mentioned earlier, if you introduce ammonia and chlorine and mix it, uh, it will create a <coughs> new disinfectant uh, called chloramine. So you can kind of see by the graph there, um, the monochloramine is the one we want for disinfection purposes. Um, so the ideal zone for that is if you mix 4.5 to 5 um, parts of chlorine with one part of ammonia you'll create this you you ideally would create this uh chloramine uh disinfectant all right so the advantage of this is you'll have lower dvp formation because you're now your your uh, disinfectant is chloramine and not free chlorine um <clears throat> so this could be a very effective measure um to disinfect your system so um, I believe in Arizona at the moment, we only have one chloramine system and um, we had to. So it, it's not a very commonly used, but it doesn't mean it, it, it's not effective. So if it is, if the conditions are correct uh, or fits, it could be a very effective disinfectant, especially with uh, systems that have uh, groundwater that is maybe affected by um, uh, precipitation, uh, snow melt, you know, um, if your well is near a, a wash or something, introducing, um, you know, organic matter seasonally in your well, chloramines may, may be uh, the answer. Um, so the, the advantage of chloramines is you can run uh, chlorine or chloramines without having to alter your system too much. So um, if you have a chloramine setup, you can run chlorine during the month that, you know, DVP formation is less likely, like in the winter. And then you can run your chloramines when you have, uh, you know, high organic matter, warm water, uh, <clears throat> um, but, um, so like I said, it's a, you know, it's another one where you're kind of creating that chemical, right? And it's not as easy as chlorine where we just have to dose it and measure the residual, right? This one is you're introducing a different type of uh, chemical. You have a, a different a piece of equipment to measure the chloramines. Um, it's more effective, so that means it's stronger. So it could have some other uh, issues with it. So listed there in the dis, um, disadvantages is uh, one of them is nitrification, right? So you can have nitrification from the ammonia. So if your ammonia is not used up, uh, does not react 100% with the chlorine, you can introduce nitrogen into uh, your system. So <clears throat> uh, that's why we have that ideal zone up there, 4.5 to 5 parts of chlorine for one part of ammonia. Uh, systems that run this, though they may introduce a little extra chlorine to assure that all the ammonia is reacts to create the chloramine, so we don't have the nitrification issue. But again, so now, now we're looking at a balance. You're do, you're dosing more chlorine than you need um, because of the issue of the ammonia, 
So we're kind of back at square one where the chlorine, now you have free chlorine and chloramines in the system. The free chlorine has the opportunity to react with your disinfection byproducts. So again, a good balance, um, lots of testing and you know non-compliance testing and startup monitoring <coughs> to run these types of system. Like I say, take what I say with the grain of salt. There are, um, and in my experience, there there can be a lot of issues with, with with this system. If your system is a start stop, like the well kicks on, you know, multiple times a day, the chloramine is not very user friendly with this. You know, it likes more smooth, continuous dosing, uh, and not on off on off. Right. So we'll see. <clears throat> you can see buildup, and then also now you have ammonia and chlorine. Um, as chemicals to deal with, right? So they can't be stored in the same unit. You, um, you can off gas, ammonia gas, you know, very dangerous, similar to how you can't clean your bathroom with ammonia and uh, chlorine, right? You're gonna create a gas uh, and um, could be dangerous to the operator. So again, we check for this when you install this type of system, we need to ventilate the area well. Um, the chlorine needs to be stored in, or sorry, the ammonia needs to be stored in a cool uh, location separate from the chlorine. Um, so if you do have it in the same building, you know, you need to separate it by room, uh, have ventilations for both, uh, for both rooms for where the chlorine is, is stored and the ammonia. Uh, recommended to have the, the switch for the ventilator on the outside of the room, ventilate the room for five minutes before entering. Um, so again so <clears throat> at what cost do we want to use a different type of disinfectant in order to reduce our dvps so <clears throat> this is all questions you want to ask if you have dvps in your system um, whether you should go with a different type of uh, disinfectant whether you want to treat for the precursors or if you want to put in treatment which is the topic we'll go over next Okay, so I know that's a lot of information. Uh, we're going to jump into treatment. This section will be um, pretty short um, because, um, as you'll see, I am not a, a huge fan of treating uh, DVPs, and I'll tell you what. Okay, so we talked a, a little bit about today about uh, a surface water treatment. Um, and the reason is the DVP formation generally happens more often with surface water systems than groundwater systems. Groundwater systems, you have less, uh, you can have less, or you will have less organic matter in the groundwater unless it's influenced by the first surface water somehow or it, it naturally occurs in, in your aquifer. Uh, surface water system, um, you know, you have ver uh, very little control of the surface water and quality as some parts of the year, depending on the weather and the usage and, you know, that. So, um, you know, you have a, a higher chance of having uh, organic matter in your in your water. So, <clears throat> make sure I'm on time here. Um, so, depends on how, how much, uh, how advanced your treatment system is for your surface water treatment system. So, you can have a small system that just does direct filtration, right? You you have your surface water rules that you need to to meet, and 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 then you disinfect. However, you know TOC, uh, total organic carbon indicator of uh, natural organic matter, is not a primary contaminant and does not have a has a uh, you know you you need to only remove I say like 15% in your in your treatment system and then there are systems that have waivers systems that uh, are not required to remove toc even though it can cause disinfection by products so you just have a simple uh, filtration unit with a little vacuation or coagulation um, you'll, you'll you'll be able to treat your water to the safe drinking water act uh, regulation however you'll you won't remove much of that toc so in arizona toc um, it's very, um, you know, it's very low compared to other um, other sources in the the U.S. So, for example, Mississippi River, right? That water is very turbid, um, has a high concentration of TOC. Colorado River, you're you're looking at two to four 
uh, milligrams per liter of TOC. So at a lower level, it's very difficult to move. You know, at a high level, you know, if you have TOC 10, 20 uh, parts per million, it's easy to remove 15%. But once you're at four, two to four, it's very little to remove to meet the TOC requirements. So all that TOC is going through the system, even at a little amount, you know, you have a little amount sitting in your storage tank, but if you have a week of water age, your chlorine is going to react. And then that two parts per million of TOC is accumulating, reacting with your chlorine, creating disinfection byproducts, right? <clears throat> so a recommendation here is to pre-treat your water. Or So this is pre-treatment for disinfection byproducts, which means treatment for your surface water system. You have effective sedimentation, coagulation, flocculation, filtration. Um, adding, if that means adding membrane filtrations after um, your traditional media uh, filters, this will definitely help. You know, ultra filtration, nano filtration, all very, you know, you know, can be expensive, but uh, can be effective. Um, and then, you know, or there's um, GAC, granular activated carbon that can be used as a polishing uh, filter for your traditional filters. So all these, if you want to, the best way to prevent DVPs is to remove the organic matter in your water. Uh, that way, when you're introducing chlorine, your chlorine demand will be a lot less and it doesn't have an opportunity to react with your um, with the any or natural organic matter. So if you do have to have long water age in your storage tank because your area is prone to fires, then we want to protect the water by removing the TOC, the turbidity, natural organic matter, uh, so we can have the that long water age, but not have DVP formations. Okay. So next, uh, I want to talk about uh, um, GAC, granular activated carbon. Um, it is an effective measure to remove DVPs after it's formed. So you'll see this in um, households, right? You have your, your filtration systems under your sinks with that black uh, GAC. This is in your Brita filter. It does remove DVPs, but this is, um, in my opinion, this is, you know, you're forming DVPs to remove them. So if it's something that you have to do and or a temporary measure, you know, we can use GAC to remove DVPs, but, um, you know, we want to prevent it as much as possible before going into the treatment option for the actual DVP contaminant. Um, so PROS uh, is a very simple technology. It's an absorption. We'll pull out the DVPs in your water. Um, and it can be very effective, um, you know, but <laughs> cons, it can be expensive, especially the, the GAC is gonna be used up and are you gonna throw it away or are you gonna recharge it or uh, recharge it or add new one it can be very expensive. Another pro or con is uh, GAC doesn't, you know, target specifically DVPs. It also takes out other things. It can be good or bad, you know, it'll take, it can, be effective with PFAS, right? Uh, it can be effective with other other things, but also it will take out chlorine in your water. So now your water after the GAC is no longer have chlorine residual. So um, it, you know you you may be <laughs> treating for DBPs, but now your water doesn't have chlorine, and you can't um, guarantee protection from it from uh, bacteria issues downline. So. Um, like I said, we talked about GAC. You can use it as a polishing uh, filter in your surface water treatment plant train before you introduce chlorine. That way it doesn't get used up. And then now you have a lower chance of organic matter in your water. You can use it in your distribution system um, as point of use devices to remove uh, DVPs. Um, and other contaminants, you recommend it, you know, if, if you have to, if you're, even if you're at a, uh, not at the uh, MCL, you know, you may, your customers may be interested in, you know, introducing a GAC um, to their sinks to, to protect them from potential DBP issues. Okay. So we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, um, I will skip the video and kind of just explain this. And I believe this is my last uh, topic here. 
So this is a method um, to treat for DVPs. It's uh, aeration in your storage tank. So uh, what it does is I have the YouTube link here and I'll share it in the chat if you guys want to take a look at this video at a later date. Um, this is, I'm sorry, this is um, how to treat for DVPs in your system, uh, in your storage tank. So you have your water coming in and you're introducing chlorine into your tank and you have a chance of forming DVPs because of one reason or another, maybe your, your organic matter is high, right? So what this uh, system does is it'll take water in your storage tank and it'll uh, spray it across the top here with uh, through small pores, create, introducing air into the system and creating these, uh, volatilizing these uh, DVPs, uh, especially THMs. And then you have a blower at the top of your tank. Um, we've seen it where it can blow directly down or across the, the airspace there in your tank. And then all the volatilized THMs will get blown out the top and will remove your, your DVP. So a good, a good treatment in your storage tank, all right? If you uh, have DVP issues, if you're not able to remove the organic matter and you know it's going to react with your chlorine, and this is the only way you can set up your system without um, and treat for uh, DVPs. You know, pros, it's very effective. It, it can work uh, really well. Uh, cons, you know, you're only treating at your storage tank. So if you have water issues in your distribution, um, you know, you do still have that opportunity to create those DVPs, right? Um, another con is, I believe I have it listed here, some uh, high electricity costs. Um, you know, you're, you, you're going to have a high uh, electricity cost for the blower, uh, air blower that stri strips the uh, VOCs out. Um, and then you have the opportunity to also remove chlorine, right? So chlorine is, can be, you know, you, you bubble your water, uh, chlorine can be removed in that stage. So this one, you're aerating it, right? It's spraying down, so it has a lower chance of removing chlorine and more concentrated on removing the the volatile chemicals, but um, you know you can so systems that I've seen have had a larger chlorine demand because they're stripping it with uh, they're doing uh, tank aeration to re remove DVP. So, um, and here's an example. We we did some work with the city of Chandler. Um, this is using uh, this is an example. We're uh, uh, kind of piloting. Uh, we're running the water from a hydrant into this aeration unit and it has uh, thousands of small pores here the water is coming out aerated so we sample this we sample this water and um, you know we had a certain amount of dvps uh, in the line and after aerating it it'll show the you know that the dvps are stripped and, and we're left with the lower concentration so this is just a, a pilot it's not a production um, method is just showing the technology, same, same technology we have here when the water is spraying, uh, spraying down from the, the tank. Okay, so I know that was a lot of information. That's all I have. Um, do we have any questions? It looks like we have one from Lori. Now, thank you, by the way. It was an awesome presentation. Uh, Lori's asking about total chlorine and free chlorine. Which is required to be measured uh, and can total be measured? In the place of free? Um, so the required measurement, and um, you can ask, uh, re, um, Aaron can uh, confirm this in his presentation, but the uh, required is free chlorine is required like at your uh, RTCR location for compliance. Um, and then I believe uh, for surface water system, free chlorine is also required at the EPDS to ensure that you're meeting your um, disinfection contact time. Uh, and then you can also measure, but total is not um, uh, required. However, if you have a field test kit for chlorine, uh, it should come with uh, free, uh, you can measure both free or total, depending on the uh, method you use. So um, for example, if you have a hawk test kit, 
Um, you have different um, pillows that you can introduce to the water to measure free or total, and they have a, a little bit of a different procedure, but it's more or less the same. Um, so if you're taking free chlorine residual in the field, I would recommend taking total at the same time. Um, it takes you an extra five minutes, I think. Um, and then, you know, you can, yeah, so if you have a big discrepancy between total and free, you, it's a good indicator that, you know, you have a high chlorine demand somewhere and then you can kind of track it down. So if it's downstream, you can go upstream and continue to measure it and until you kind of narrow the area of the issue. So it could be an indicator of a line break. So if you have total and free at the EPDS, more or less the same. And then, you know, 100 feet down the line, your free is at zero and your total is, is high. That means you have a bacteria in, uh, or some sort of something that's causing a chlorine demand within that 100 feet. Okay, thank you. We have a few more questions here um, from Joan. Our water system of 40 customers uh, is only of 40 customers. What is the best disinfection agent? Um, so for 40 customers, and uh, I'm assuming it's a groundwater system, um, I would say <coughs> chlorine um, would be the, the best, right? Um, again, just um, a lot of these smaller systems, uh, you know, you just don't buy a chlorinator and, and walk away from it, you know. Um, that's why we recommend that getting it designed correctly, especially if you're introducing a tablet chlorinator. It's a lot harder to control the uh, chlorine dosing uh, because it's going to change depending on how many tab tablets are in it, how, how fast it's getting used up. So. Uh, my recommendation would be liquid sodium hypochlorite. Uh, know how much you're, um, you're dosing. This is a lot easier to calculate how much you're dosing because you can do it with a graduated cylinder, right? You turn on your pump, measure how many how much chlorine is going in, use the, the calculator that was uh, described in the earlier uh, presentation, and then you can kind of use it as an indicator, right? Because after you kind of know where you, how much you want to dose, then you're going to do field tests to make to ensure that that is the correct amount, right? So, um, so for a small system, I would dose less than one part per million. Measure at your furthest point to make sure you still have residual, and then you can go down from there. You know, a safe uh, a, a safe amount is 0.2 uh, milligrams per liter in the system. Um, that should give you enough chlorine to kind of attack to any contamination. And then, um, you know, and that gives you a lower amount too. The maximum contaminant level is four. You'll, be, you'll start to smell it at like <clears throat> two parts per million, especially if it's reacting with something in the water. So um, I would just, if you're going to introduce it, I would introduce it slow. You know, if you have a good operator, they should know how to introduce the chlorine you know, they'll start at 0.2, increase to 0 0.4, 0 0.6, and they'll get to a level where they're comfortable at, where you have residual at your furthest point, and then you have a safe amount going into your system. Perfect. Um, just to confirm, Nam, the procedure is the same for a well and a tank, correct? Uh, for dosing chlorine? Yes. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, the okay. procedure is the, the same. Um, when you're dosing at a tank, uh, your demand will most likely be a little higher since you'll have that water age, uh, that time for the chlorine to degrade in your storage tank. So this comes back to the uh, water age, where when you're, um, if you're dosing at the well and it goes straight into the distribution, then um, you know you'll have less of less of that water age. Then you can also dose at the well and it goes into the storage tank, which is the same as dosing at the storage tank. Okay. Um, thank you. For Robinson here, um, partial uh, draining periodically of storage tanks, uh, does that reduce uh, DBP formation? Uh, definitely. Um, um, one thing I didn't cover, but uh, we, uh, we have seen DBP issues in schools that have storage tanks and um, there's school sessions out for the summer. They come back in the uh, fall and we have DVP issues because that water sat all summer. Um, so for systems like this, it's definitely a good idea to drain it, flush it. Um, you can 
clean it and disinfect it and uh, get it ready for, for the new year. Um, and then if you do have DVP issues and you've located it in your tank, um, you can, you know, partially drain it to get you a good, you know, flow of new water uh, to kind of almost shock it and then implement your, your countermeasure. Because if you, if you, you know, change something, uh, you're still going to have all that water and it's going to take a while for it to work through. Whereas if you drain it and you have a, some fresh water, you'll have more effective uh, results. Okay, perfect. And just a little bit of feedback from Lori. Uh, thank you, ADQ and KUV. Thank you very much, Lori, for that feedback. That's all the questions for now. Okay, great. Well, thank you for attending. Um, um, I hope you guys uh, got something from this. It's a, it's a very important topic that um, I've been working on. Uh, we, ADQ does provide assistance with these. I'm working with a couple systems already that have DVP issues. So feel free to re reach out to me. We have a very good technical assistance program where, so you're not, you know, you're not alone in, in this. We're not, ADQ does just want to issue violations for DVPs. So we we want to, you know, prevent these from, from happening. We understand that if you do have issues, it takes a while to get removal. So we definitely want to be involved and assist the water system as much as possible. Perfect. Thank you, Nam. All right. For our last 30 minutes, we'll be covering the DVP rule with Aaron. Aaron, are you on right now and ready to present? I am on. Perfect. Let me go ahead and transfer the screen to you. Oh, you got it. Perfect. I got it. All right, let's launch this. Can you hear me okay? Can you see my presentation? Looking good. Excellent. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Aaron Hyatt. Uh, I am currently the manager of the Drinking Water Monitoring and Protection Unit here at ADQ. Uh, just a bit of background, I was born and raised in Arizona. Uh, my parents met at ASU, so by default, I'm a Sun Devil. Um, I spent some time in Baltimore working for local public health departments and small water systems for about 10 years. And then I've spent about 10 years in Australia as well, working with municipal water systems. So uh, if you're doing math, I've got about 20 years of experience in the industry and I've been with ADQ for about three years. Uh, so I'm, I'm very happy to present to you today. So today we're gonna to go over uh, the monitoring requirements for disinfection byproducts. Um, this is uh, important so that we can have visibility and see what's happening and talk about all the, the ways that you can react when there are issues. But before we get into all that, I wanna share this slide with you. And probably at this point, you're feeling a bit like this guy. You're thinking, geez, you know, I've got a lot of things happening all at once and I'm trying to balance a lot of different things. If I don't chlorinate the water, I have a microbial risk, but if I put too much chlorine in the water or disinfectant in the water, I've got a disinfection byproduct risk. So I have two things that I'm trying to balance. You know, am I worried about drowning or am I worried about the shark that's about to get me? And I just want to point out that there, there, this very much is about balancing risk, but it's important to keep your eye on the, the actual, the really significant risks. So disinfection byproducts are an impact to public health. They are an, a, a chronic impact to public health. In other words, it's more than likely going to take several years for those health effects to start to happen in your population. So it's going to take a long exposure generally for those effects to happen. But we always we obviously want to reduce those from happening as much as possible. But in contrast, the microbial risk can have an impact within hours or days. And that very often leads to very significant waterborne outbreaks and it will almost immediately hospitalize people and it will be a big issue. So if we have to choose between the two, what I'm telling you is the microbial risk is the most important one to manage. Now it's up to you whether you decide whether the microbial risk is drowning or the shark. I'll let you make your own decisions on that. But it is important to remember that not all risks are the same and that the microbial risk is the most important one to manage. So we want to make sure that the water is disinfected appropriately in response to a microbial risk. But as you're doing that, be mindful that if, you, if you're not doing the disinfection properly, you're going to have these other risks to manage later on. So we've talked a, a lot today about chemistry already. Uh, apologies, I haven't seen all of the previous presentations, but I know you, you by now you probably get the idea that disinfection byproducts are happening through a combination of the organic matter when reacting with the disinfection uh, that you're adding to the water and then just basically you know, let it sit and combine and react. 
The two most important factors though are that water age, so the length of time that these two things have been reacting together, those total organic carbons and, and the disinfectant, and temperature. So uh, in my experience back in Australia, we found that temperature had a, a very significant impact on this. So if you left your, your chlorine, your vat of chlorine sitting out in the sun, you were more likely to have issues with disinfection byproducts than if you put a shade, you know, put it under a roof. So there are very simple things that you can do, like Nam said, that can reduce the amount of disinfection byproducts you have in your system that don't cost a lot of money, that can have an impact. You might need to progressively be more aggressive with dealing with that, but there are some simple things you can do. The, the point I wanna make here though, is that currently only total trihalomethanes and haloacetic acids, uh, five of them, are regulated formally under the Safe Drinking Water Act. But if you've been in this industry for any length of time, you probably appreciate that there are lots more. There are hundreds, if not thousands of disinfection byproducts. And at some point, those may be regulated as well. So these two, the TTHMs and the HA5s, are really just an indicator if there's something wrong with your system, if you've got that balance wrong between how you're adding the disinfectant and, and how the water is flowing through your system. So uh, I don't know that EPA is aggressively chasing adding any uh, regulated uh, disinfection byproducts, but they're always considering it. So. Right now, we just have these two. Uh, one quick note, I'm not gonna talk about the, the maximum residual disinfectant level, or the, the maximum amount of chlorine that you can add to your water, or the, the total organic carbon alkalinity, the TOCA, uh, in this presentation per se, but those are two important parts of this rule as well. So uh, if you don't know already, these are the maximum contaminant levels. So these are the highest levels that you are permitted to have in your water before you need to start taking action to reduce those levels. And so and it, it, this is in milligrams per liter, uh, but in parts per billion, that would be 80 for the total trihalomethanes or 60 for the haloacetic acids. So uh, those are pretty standard levels. EPA, if you're aware, is chasing, is slowly getting more aggressive in terms of acceptable levels. PFAS is the best. Uh, they're getting down to parts per trillion or parts per quadrillion. So these are, uh, for the moment, seem to be working for us. Who's affected by all of this? Well, uh, as I said, disinfection byproducts are a chronic or a longer term exposure. So basically, if you operate a public water system where people are going to be drinking your water on an extended basis, you're covered by this rule. So another way to think about this, transient systems, non-community transient systems, the, the best example is like a restaurant or a gas station. People are coming in, maybe having a glass of water and then moving on. Those systems are not covered by this monitoring requirement. Um, the, the one other quick thing to note, if you are a community or a non-transient system and you're using disinfectant temporarily, so let's say you've detected E. coli in your water and you're, you're going to disinfect the system and flush it out, this does that does not fall under these monitoring requirements. These are intended for systems that are uh, routinely, consistently ongoing monitor or adding disinfectant to the water. So we want to see what the impact of that is and that it's being managed appropriately. So what is the sampling requirement? Well, if you are serving less than 10,000 people, generally you're not going to be taking a lot of samples. You're, you're a smaller system. The, the, we would expect that the formation of disinfection byproducts isn't going to be as great as in some of those larger systems where there might be pockets of stagnant water. Um, you're going to take one sample per year, generally, uh, per chlorinated source. So if you have multiple chlorine sources, we're going to be monitoring each of those. And you're going to take it during, no surprise here, during the warmest parts of the year, so between June 1st and September 30th. And we also want you to take them at locations within your system where you're most likely going to have the oldest water. So where is the water sat in your system the longest? That's where we want to target. That's probably going to be your hotspot. If you're serving more than 10,000 people, or 10,000 people or more, then you're going to be taking one sample per, per quarter. Again, you're going to be targeting those maximum uh, residence times where the stagnant water is the most. You do have a lot of flexibility here. Generally, you're probably going to have a much larger system, so you're going to have more options in terms of where you can sample. But we want to see at least 25% of the samples you take are at places where you have the oldest water. 
So that's a, a process uh, that you go through to try to figure out where the water is flowing through your system. But it's very important when you're talking about monitoring that you know how the water is flowing through your system. One thing that comes up with this rule quite often is the phrase every 90 days. And that's a, a a, a thing that's very unique to the disinfection byproduct rule. With all the other rules in the Safe Drinking Water Act, generally we say you need to take a sample during a period of time, and it doesn't really matter when you take that sample. So if you're on annual monitoring, let's say for nitrates, you can take that sample anytime you want during that year. That's not the case with a disinfection byproduct rule. So the, the idea was that you really need to see the disinfection byproduct levels at, at equal intervals throughout the year. So they did not want systems to go out and sample, let's say on June 30th, and then turn around and sample again on July 1st. You get a bunch kind of uh, data points. So you're not really seeing the impact of climate or of changes of use and demand in the system that you would if they were evenly spaced out. Unfortunately, a lot of people have focused on the every 90 days. And what you might appreciate is that we don't have 360 days in a year. So if you are sampling over multiple years, you're gonna get what I call calendar creep. So you might've started sampling at the beginning of May, and then after a few years, you find that you're sampling at the end of October. So EPA in its guidance, when you read in the supporting materials to the Safe Drinking Water Act says that, while they said every 90 days, what they really meant was approximately every 90 days. And what they're trying to do is to make sure that the samples are spaced out throughout the year. So the way uh, ADEQ interprets this rule, which I, I'll go through a, a little bit later in the presentation, is that if you're sampling in the same month and the same week of the month in each quarter, that you should be in compliance with this rule. But I, I just wanna point out that every 90 days, does not mean exactly every 90 days. And we'll talk about that a bit later. So another uh, important concept with disinfection byproduct sampling is the idea versus dual samples and individual samples. So if you're sampling, if you only have one sample location, you're, you're one of those small systems where you only have to take samples in one location, then obviously you're gonna take both TTHM samples and HA5 samples at the same location. We call that a dual sample, and that's an option for a lot of our systems to take dual samples. But there are instances uh, for our very small systems where you might be required to take individual samples. So in other words, there is a spot in your system where you tend to find higher levels of TTHMs, and we would definitely want you to be sampling for those at the, that location. There might be a completely different location in your system that happens to be higher in HA5. So obviously in the sampling, we're trying to get the worst case scenario. What are the highest levels that you're likely likely to see, see in your system, and that will help us in, uh, provide better advice about things you can do to reduce those levels, but also it'll help us give us, give us a sense of how well that system is being operated and how, how well those uh, uh, disinfection byproducts are being managed. So this is just a phrasing thing. So a dual sample just basically means you're sampling for both at one location. Uh, I've said this already, uh, sample locations are based on hotspots. Uh, back when EPA released the stage two version of the disinfection byproduct rule, they also had a requirement for an initial distribution system evaluation. That's a really fancy way of saying that they wanted systems to go out and take samples throughout your network to identify those locations where you are actually getting higher levels of disinfection byproducts. That was a one-off requirement. So if you were a public water system, I believe from around, two, I, I can't remember the exact dates, but around 2010 to 2015, you probably had to go through this uh, process. And that was used to inform your, your sampling plan. That if that requirement has lapsed, it's, it's the sun has set on that requirement and you no longer have to do that. However, the EPA is currently reviewing the disinfection byproduct rule and evaluating whether that should be an ongoing requirement. So in other words, if you didn't go through that process back when you had to, and you're a new water system, do you then have to go through that process to, to identify where you're gonna sample? And also if your network changes significantly, 
so let's say you you run a water system that had 15 service connections and and through good fortune you find that you're now serving 50 service connections that's a significant change to your distribution system which also means that where you sample might change as well so I personally am a fan of, of being able to evaluate your distribution system on a regular basis. Uh, it would be nice to have some very clear and explicit guidance about when you need to do that. Uh, we will always encourage you to, to do a sampling program to make sure that you understand your network and how it's performing so that you can make sure you're sampling at the right locations. So uh, once you've identified the hotspots, the other really key consideration is that you need to monitor based on the month with the highest DBP concentration. So like I said, the quarterly is kind of a fixed thing. We want to have a regular uh, check-in points throughout the year when you're monitoring. But we also want to make sure that when you're doing that monitoring, that you're capturing the, the month that you had the highest DBP concentration. So that's always going to be the anchor point for your sampling program. We're always going to want you to sample in that month. And again, like with unlike other uh, sampling requirements of the Safe Drinking Water Act, this is a very specific one. You do have to sample in the month with the highest concentration. We have had a lot of water systems that that you know were sampling in July, and then suddenly they're sampling in August, and and we get a bit uh, out of out of whack. And we want them to make sure that they're consistent in monitoring that. Interestingly, that month could change. So you might take, uh, you might have taken annual samples in the past, and historically, the month with your highest concentration was August. And for whatever reason, we get other samples and other months of the year, and you find out, well, actually, September is now my highest month. So that will change based on the data that ADEQ has. So if we uh, become aware of another month that has the highest concentration, then we will change your sampling schedule and requirements to match and align with that. So where do you sample? Uh, I, I think probably intuitively you probably you have some ideas of where you might sample. Water age is definitely one of the big targets. Um, higher temperatures and residence times, those are always uh, key factors to consider. You would all, uh, after a mixing zone, if you have two different, if you have two different storages mixing together, if you have a storage that suddenly mixes with a well you know after a mixing zone is a great place to, to sample always always downstream of storage facilities again some anything downstream of a storage facility by nature is going to be a, a higher age it's going to be more stagnant water the ends of a distribution system are great to and the, another key factor is to look at pockets in your distribution system where you have a low disinfectant Obviously, that means the disinfectant is reacting with uh, a lot of the things in the water, and, and that's where you're going to be generating a lot of the disinfection byproducts. We aren't very specific about um, where you choose your sampling sites. We just ask that you justify them. You have some kind of logic that makes sense. So if someone were to submit to me a sampling plan and says, oh, hey, I'm going to sample you know, five connections upstream of this one million gallon storage tank, I'd probably go back to them and say you need to reconsider. But generally, if you're looking at these types of issues and you can justify your sampling points, then we're going to be OK with it. So when do you sample or, or how many samples do you need to take? And one of the things I want to point out here is that we're going to talk in a moment about reduced monitoring. And so the difference uh, in, in routine monitoring versus reduced monitoring is generally going to be, for the larger systems, the number of samples you're taking. So if you look at this table, you notice that whether you're surface water or groundwater, your frequency is the same. You're going to be sampling quarterly. Again, these are systems with more 10,000 people or more. You're going to be taking dual samples at each of your sample locations. And then it's based on population. And again, the logic there is the, the larger the population, the bigger your distribution system is going to be, and probably the more sample sites you need to make sure that you're catching all the, the pockets where disinfection byproducts might be forming. So between 10,000 and 50,000, you're going to be taking four samples per quarter. And generally, we want you to be including at least two of those with the highest TTHM locations and one with the highest HAA5. 
that third column, the last column on the right, the, the third light green column, is a, is a crossover from the first stage of the rule uh, to the second stage. And what they were trying to do there is to have some consistency between the monitoring requirements. So if you had been sampling historically at this location, but it wasn't necessarily the highest or the, you know, for either of the disinfection byproducts, they wanted you to continue sampling that so that you had some, some longer history so you can look at trends throughout your system. Uh, because if you change sampling locations, that might be a different conditions which are leading to issues that you're having. So having some kind of consistency between your monitoring, having a, a, a system, a sample point that you were, um, I'll slow down a second. Having a system that you were sampling at uh, over time is good to, to have that consistency. Let's jump to systems with less than 10,000 people. And what you notice here is the, the commonality is there's only so many minimum number of samples you can take. So all of these systems, when you have up to 10,000 people, are only required to take two samples. And one of those should be the highest TTHM and one should be the, the highest HA5. The difference here is the frequency. So if you have a very small system, then you're going to be sampling just annually. But if you have between 500 and, and 10,000 people, then you're going to be sampling quarterly. The, you also see this is where you have the choice between individual or dual samples. So if you're a smaller system, again, you may not have as many sampling locations to, to go to, but you do have a choice whether you're going to do dual samples at those two locations or individual. So like I said, let's talk about reduced monitoring. So uh, I want to talk about a concept that they introduced with the stage two first. Originally, uh, when the disinfection byproduct rule came out, I believe in the 90s, the, the sampling was based on uh, what happened at your system as a whole. And so we would average together the results of all of your sampling locations. And what you might appreciate with that is if you had a particular spot in your system where you're getting high disinfection byproducts, that, would be, that could be averaged out if all the rest of your system was getting low. And there was a lot of discussion about that particular, uh, I guess you could call it a loophole. And they decided, no, it actually is important to know um, by location if you're having issues with disinfection byproducts. Some of the um, measures could be, like Nam said, installing aerators and storage tanks. It could also be improving the flow through that particular area so that you're not getting that pocket. So when stage two came around, they changed the compliance assessment to make it a locational running annual average. So in other words, we assess compliance at each sampling location. And that means that theoretically it's possible if you had five sampling locations to have five separate violations. So each sampling location is a compliance point on its own. So we do locational running annual average. So you need to be mindful of each location and we do an annual average at each location to determine whether there's an issue. Uh, we don't give you credit for missed quarter monitoring. So if you only sampled for one quarter and you fail to take the samples for the other three quarters, that's how we're gonna assess compliance. So it is in your interest to, to play the averages and to get as many samples in as possible uh, to get all four quarters in so that we can make sure that that's actually reflective of what's happening your with your water over the year. Again, this is a chronic type exposure and we want to see what people are, are um, being exposed to over the entire year, not just during one quarter of the year before we make a decision about whether something needs to be done. So you can qualify for reduced monitoring if your locational running annual average at all locations is at or below 50% of the maximum contaminant level. So for TTHMs, that would be the 0 0.040 milligrams per liter, and for the HA5s, that's the 0 0.030. There's also the requirement of having a surface water, uh, total organic carbon of less than four. Uh, so if you are a surface water system, we wanna make sure that you're not dealing with water uh, that has a lot of total organic carbons in it, which I think for most of the state is, is pretty good. So you can stay on reduced monitoring if, you, if you're on quarterly already. So if you're one of those systems that's greater than 10,000 people, then you need to stay below that 50%. But if you're one of the smaller systems, the, the bar is a little bit lower for you in the sense that you don't need to be 50%, you need to be 75% to stay on reduced monitoring. 
So if you exceed the 50 or 75, all that's going to happen is we're going to put you back on to routine monitoring and just let that run for a bit until you qualify again in the future for reduced. You need to submit a written request for that. Uh, we don't allow you to self-reduce, uh, but we do look at your results and we will try, uh, and, and that's a, a, um, a courtesy to notify you when you qualify for that. But if you notice it on your own that you qualify for that reduced monitoring and we haven't contacted you, please reach out to us. We're happy to review it and, and to make that change as much as possible. I appreciate every water system has financial constraints and certainly sampling less is, is a good thing for you to save a few dollars over time. So we want you to, to be on the right sampling frequency and, and using your money as wisely as possible. So again, I pointed out that a lot of the changes here aren't necessarily uh, timing, but number of samples. So before, uh, if you were a system with the 10,000 to 50, you had to take four samples. On reduced monitoring, you only have to take two. So we cut the, the number of samples that you have to take in half. Uh, what you notice here, you can't reduce the number of samples for 10 for people for systems with less than 10,000 people. So what we change here is the timing. So uh, you notice that's where annually uh, comes in for those systems that were 500 to 10,000 before it was quarterly, it becomes annually. Uh, and for the groundwater systems, there's even the potential to sample once every three years if you have less than 500 people in your water system. So what do we do if something goes bad? So if you have an MCL exceedance, then we are going to uh, put you onto quarterly monitoring regardless of what type of system you're on, mostly because we want to see what's happening. And the best way we can see what's happening is to get more data. And so if any location, uh, again, that locational running annual average exceeds the TTHM or HA5, you're going to go on uh, quarterly monitoring. And that's at all locations, not just that one location, because we want to see what's happening across the entire system. Uh, like I said, the quarterly monitoring is every 90 days. And, and the quickest way to think about this to make sure you're in compliance with this rule is to just figure out which uh, month of the quarter you want to sample. The best way is to look at what your month of highest concentration is. And so here's a little table, you know, color coded. So if it happens that your system, uh, the highest month is July, then you're going to be sampling in the first month of each quarter from during your quarterly monitoring requirement. And then what you're going to do is you're going to look at um, what week of the month you, that you want to sample. So if I have to sample in July, I'm going to try to sample the first week of July. We don't really care which week you choose, just that you stick with that week once you've chosen it. So if I choose the first month of July, then I'm going to choose the first month of or the first week of the first month of each quarter and just be consistent with that. Uh, we are there is some consideration for, let's say you, you sample at the beginning of the second week. Uh, I, I really don't want to get into those. I think being able to sample within a week is reasonable enough. But if for whatever reasons you, you think you might not get the first week and you might get, get the beginning of the second week, give us a call. We'll talk about it and, and work with you. But the goal would be pick the month of the quarter and pick the week of the month and just stick with that and you'll be in compliance with those 90 days. So you do get a violation from us, uh, a maximum contaminant level violation from us if you exceed the, the locational running annual average. And that happens at the moment that you're guaranteed to exceed it. So for example, uh, the I'll just use parts per billion because it's easier to work in whole numbers. The, the, M, the maximum contaminant level for total uh, trihalomethanes is 80. If at any point you report to us that you had 320, so that's four times that 80, then you would immediately be in violation of the maximum contaminant level. Because even if you got zeros for the rest of the quarters, you're guaranteed to be uh, uh, exceeding that maximum contaminant level at the end of those four quarters. So anytime that you have uh, a sum of the results uh, for quarters that are greater than four times MCL, you're more than likely going to be getting a violation. The violation requires that you do a public notice, which is a tier two public notice, which means you have to tell your uh, your customers, uh, the consumers of your water, that there's been an issue with disinfection byproducts within 30 days. If you fail to take a sample, that's a mismonitoring violation, and that requires a tier three public notice. So you have a year to tell people that you didn't take the samples that were required. 
Um, and once you have uh, at least four consecutive quarters with the result below the MCL, we can move you back to routine monitoring and, and even potentially back to reduced monitoring. So obviously you need to deal with the problem and get it back to acceptable levels before we're gonna uh, change that sampling schedule. Just real quickly, I know I have a minute left, but uh, we have something called operational evaluation levels. And this basically is a way for systems to predict whether they're gonna have a problem with disinfection byproducts. And so basically what you're gonna do is look at your previous three quarters and you're gonna make an assumption. If nothing changes and I get the exact same results that I got in my current quarter, so quarter, quarter three, will I exceed in the next quarter? So that's why you take that current quarter times two. You're assuming your next quarter is gonna be exactly like your, your current quarter. And if you are predicted to exceed, you have to do an assessment. I'm gonna skip through these really quickly. And your assessment is basically what you would expect. You're gonna look at potential causes of your disinfection byproducts, your distribution system, your source water, your treatment, and see if there's any issues there and identify the issues and ways that you're gonna to try to address those and fix those. And those operational evaluation reports are due to us within 90 days after you get the results and we will work with you through that process. There's a lot to it, uh, compliance monitoring plans. Uh, you know, Obviously, I'm not gonna get through my presentation, but I will share it with everybody. Um, and that we have forms like you would expect from any government agency. But we, uh, if you have any questions about what's required for monitoring or for compliance, give us a call. Happy to work with you, talk you through the process. And I just wanna say as closing, appreciate everything that you're doing out there running Arizona's drinking water systems. You are a very important part of life in our state. And I appreciate all you're doing and happy to help you anytime I get a chance. And with that, I'll go over to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, I believed you may have answered the question, but just to make sure with Kelly, um, this is the last question. Um, is the 90 days strict or can there be some adjustments um, if you're not out of compliance? Yeah, like I said, it's approximate, so it's not strict. But when you feel like you're going to be in any kind of gray areas around those 90 days, please reach out to us and confirm, and, and we'll ha we're happy to have a discussion with you about it. Perfect. Um, then I think that was all of the questions for now. I'll go ahead and show our screen, uh, my screen here. Thank you, Aaron. Um, once again, thank you, everyone, for attending. For the agenda, please look in the handout section of your GoToWebinar dashboard. Uh, this webinar was recorded and we will be uploading this to our officer presentation library within the next couple of weeks um, if you have any further questions for the officer program or anyone who presented today joe from kuv consultants sergio nam or aaron um, here is their contact information and it's also located on your agenda and that um, concludes our webinar for the day thank you everyone In case some people are taking screenshots, I'll wait till we drop down to about 70 people. I did see a question on how do you earn the PDHs for today um, by accessing the agenda and the handout section. Um, you'll be able to download the document there. Please upload it to your portal account in the PDH section. Uh, today's, if you attended for the complete four hours, today's PD, uh, webinar was worth four hours.
we need further clarification on the handout section, uh, the dashboard that you should be writing questions under, or you can see the attendees list or the polls, there is definitely a line there for um, handouts. And right now, just the agenda's there.